Okay. Um, good morning and welcome members and the public to the 26th meeting in 2013 of the Health and Sport Committee. As usual, can I remind those present to switch off mobile phones, Blackberries and other wireless devices as they interfere with the sound system. Members of the public may have noticed that some members and officials are using iPads and other tablet devices. This is instead of hard copies of their papers. This morning, we have received apologies from our convener, Duncan McNeill, and from Richard Simpson, MSP. Malcolm Chisholm is with us as a Labour Party substitute this morning. The first item on the agenda today is to decide whether to take item three, work programme, in private at today's meeting and at future meetings. Can I ask members if they are agreed? Maybe. Okay, thank you. That is agreed. We move on to agenda item two, which is taking evidence on the public bodies joint working Scotland Bill. Can I welcome our first panel this morning? We have with us Dr Alan Gunning, Executive Director, Policy Planning and Performance, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, uh, Geoff Ace, Chief Executive, NHS Dumfries and Galloway, Susan Mannion, Chair of the Association of Community Health Partnerships, and Alan Gray, Director of Finance, NHS Grampian. Uh, I know the witnesses have agreed that we will go straight to questions from members. I thank them for that. And uh, Richard Lyle has intimated a desire to ask the first question. Richard. Th thank you, Kadira, and good morning, uh, lady and gentlemen. Uh, can I, first of all, start off the session by asking you in regards to the models which are being suggested uh, within the bill? Uh, I understand there's two models, lead agency model and bo body corporate model. You may have another suggestion, and I would welcome any uh, direction in regards to that. Uh, can I have your opinion in regards to the models which are being suggested? Dr Gunning? Uh, yes, uh, in Ayrshire and Arne, we carried out uh, an auction appraisal across the three councils and the NHS board as to the, the two options um, that were available to us and decided that the balance of advantage lay with the body corporate um, model. So in Ayrshire, we'll form um, three partnerships um, covering each of the council areas and they'll all be um, body corporate. Um, we felt that that model provides um, the greatest opportunity for um, close integration um, and really the only advantage we could see of the um, lead agency model um, was that it made perhaps support services um, more straightforward to provide but really these changes are not about support services, they are about supporting the better seamless delivery of frontline services. On that. Mr. Um, similarly, in Dumfries and Galloway, we'll, we are most likely to go for the uh, body corporate model. That's our working assumption at the moment. We haven't, as uh, Esh and Aaron have progressed to making that a formal decision yet in front of the board and the council. But that's our assumption for our, our work going forward with the council at the moment. And as Alan says, it, it, it's a model that seems to offer a good degree of flexibility and uh, local ability to, to influence change on the ground. Thank you. Ms Mannion? Um, thank you. I think that the uh, at the moment, what's coming back from the colleagues across Scotland is that there's, there are still a number of <coughs> sorry, discussions that are taking place about the models themselves. It would appear that most areas seem to be moving towards the body corporate uh, model for the, for the reasons that have just been described. Although saying that, I think the intent and the purpose with both models are, are, are the same around developing integration. It's just entirely dependent upon historic uh, positions and uh, local preference in relation to the best delivery model. When it comes to alternatives, I'm not sure that we're actually considering that in any significant detail because many of the alternatives using the existing legislation exist and I think there's enough flexibility within the certainly within the draft bill to be able to allow for local flexibility within within the, the two models that are being suggested. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mannion. Alan Gray. And maybe just to wrap up on that, in terms of NHS Grampian, we've adopted the same position as Adam Fries that we'll be formally taking a decision to the board in October. It's likely they will be supporting the, the body corporate model as a preference across NHS Grampian. The indication we have from local authority partners is they're likely to follow suits in support of that decision, but that again is in the, uh, the remit of their council uh, over the next uh, few months. Uh, I'm taking that from what you've said, the general consensus that uh, the body corporate model is a model that most uh, are going to go down. But um, can I ask, do you share the concerns of 
some local authorities over the governance and accountability of the body corporate model. Yes, Dr Gunning. I think that is one of the areas that, that really needs to be um, clarified and um, I would use the phrase nailed down um, because uh, I think there are some, um, some uncertainties that I'm sure are still being worked through. I think the governance and accountability arrangements will be um, clarified um, and I think that's important because what we don't want is set up the, the, the new bodies and you know there are some uncertainties and that dominates the agenda rather than delivering the policy changes. Um, that are envisaged within the bill. So I think there are, there's still some work in progress there, but I'm sure it will be, um, be sorted out in due course. Have any other witnesses have anything to add in relation to that? Yes, Ms Mannion. I think it's certainly true to say that there's, there's a significant amount of clarification that's required in terms of the, of the governance and accountability. I think that both health boards and uh, councils are concerned to ensure that this is clarified. The existing accountabilities between the councils and the health boards in themselves cause, uh, cause issues and difficulties, and that's going to be absolutely central to get that one sorted. I thought that in relation to uh, issues around um, service change and when we want to look to be creating change, uh, and when we're looking at performance management, we need to be absolutely clear that there's a single uh, performance uh, management structure. There's clarity about what we need to achieve, and there's clarity about the accountability in order to be able to achieve the objectives of the organisation. And at the minute, I'm not sure the, bo the, the bill is quite clear enough on that one. Mr Gray, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I guess the point we would make around the clarity of governance is absolutely important to make a, uh, a success of the integrated uh, arrangements. Uh, the planning arrangements are very important and get absolute clarity around how these will work uh, and how these will be approved will be extremely important in making sure we set off in the right direction uh, and we've got uh, the support of both uh, organisations but also a clear plan, particularly where we've got multiple uh, local authorities uh, across uh, a health board area. Thank you. Uh, Richard, do you have any additional questions? Uh, uh, basically, you know, you've said there needs to be clarity. What, what further clarity would you suggest? And also, um, you know, you, you've, I'm sure, looked at the bill and what other suggestions, and maybe I'm taking away a lot of questions that other members have, but what other suggestions do you have or, or what concerns do you have? Can I just, before you come in and answer that, if, if um, do, I, I know, Mr. Race, we, we, we didn't take uh, uh, any evidence from you there. All four, we don't feel obliged all to have to answer the same question if you're going to make the same comments. But so, specific examples of more clarity. Does anyone want to come in on that, Dr. Gunning? I think it's areas like um, the, the the chief officer and the chief officer's um, accountability. Um, uh, both to the integrated joint board and to um, the two the two statutory agencies, and I think there are a number of things that that, that, that flow from that in relation to financial governance of the um, the integrated budget, for example. I think there's also um, fair to say that um, the the bill itself is not um, uh, particularly explicit in, in areas such as. Um, clinical and care governance, um, and certainly from the point of view of, of the NHS, staff governance is, is, is a statutory responsibility for us. Um, so again, that's another area where um, I think it just needs to be thought through in a wee bit more detail, but that's just some examples that I hope are helpful. Mr. Ace. Thanks. I, I think we have a beautifully sy a simple system in Scotland in health at the moment, and there is some nervousness when we look at the new models, that, that these have become more complex. But I think the, the key thing for us is we don't, we don't establish a governance structure that gets in the way of the change that we want to make. And, and, and I'm reasonably confident, certainly in a simple system like mine, which is coterminous with the, with the local authority, I'm reasonably confident we, we can work through a governance structure that doesn't get in the way of people um, undertaking the sort of radical service change that they need. Nonetheless, as a, as a chief executive and one that signed the accountability letter that singles, singles me out as the accountable officer, it, it is clear that our, our, our beautiful simplicity of line from cabinet secretary through the board and the chief executive 
it is becoming slightly cloudier as it goes lower than that in a, in a body corporate model or, or a lead agency model. It doesn't really make a lot of difference. So we just have to be careful that in creating this vehicle for, for more interagency change and for, for quite uh, probably dis more dispersed decision making than we've got at the moment, we don't, we don't lose some of that simplicity and clarity that we have at the moment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ace. Next question uh, from Malcolm Chisholm. I mean, I mean, I wanted to ask about the acute sector, but I mean, just to kind of follow up, first of all, on what Richard said, I mean, I think all your submissions agree that structural change is not going to, in itself, deliver the changes we want, but that's what we end up talking about a lot, because that's what's in the bill. So, I, and it's interesting to me that um, it seems to be around the, the body corporate model that most of the questions are being asked, and that's what most people seem to want to go for, so that's probably where we will have quite a lot of questions for you and and others. I mean, some people have argued, well, not many, but some have argued that in a way we don't need legislation because a lot of this can be done without log legislation and a lot of this is happening already. I mean, to what extent, what, what changes do you feel you will have to make in this bill? Because I know a lot of you have already gone down this route of closer working relations, if not integration with local authorities. So from your point of view, and it's, it's really a health point of view, what are the changes that you will have? What further steps will you have to take that you haven't already taken as a result of this bill? Okay, I see. Uh, I'll take Susan Mannion first, and then we'll come to Dr Gunning after that. Susan. I think the, uh, the, the changes are going to be a, a significant step up from the existing local arrangements that exist across Scotland. And one of the things that, that will be absolutely crucial is the integrated uh, uh, financial and service planning. The bill gives the opportunity to do that through the uh, integration plan um, and the strategic plan. Uh, but the actual bringing together of the financial resource, which will require uh, uh, a system to support operational delivery, but the crucial thing will be how do we plan uh, to be able to deliver significant service change and ensure that the resources are shifted around the system to be able to do that effectively. You can do that a lot now with uh, uh, pooled or aligned budgets, but this takes it to a whole new level. And I think the infrastructure around that to support that will be absolutely crucial to make sure that that's right. Thank you, Dr. Gunning. Yes, I think there's a couple of points of, of principle. I think the first is in relation to joint and equal responsibility and accountability um, between the, the statutory authorities. And I think that is an important point of principle because if I take health specific examples um, over the years, such as delayed discharges and, and uh, emergency admissions to acute hospitals, um, I think the targets in relation to these areas have been very much seen um, as, as health targets. And whilst we've worked very well with, um, uh, with local authority and other, other partners in this, um, I think that a, a, the, the statutory provision um, will help to clarify and strengthen that. Um, the second point of principle, I think, is the more formalised role of um, the third and independent sectors, um, as well as the um, uh, users and carers in local communities um, themselves. So I think that builds very well on the good work that's been done in reshaping care for older people and, and the approach that's been adopted there. Um, and then I think um, there, there, there's probably a third point, um, which is around the importance of locality planning. Um, and I think that's particularly important um, in health and the fact that, you know, um, there will be statutory underpinning to take forward locality planning um, is important. Planning for place is not something that is um, always deeply embedded, embedded within the NHS planning process. Um, and therefore, I think, uh, so we tend to um, look at um, disease classifications or age um, or, or whatever. But of course, we know many of the the challenges that faces are for people with um, comorbidities and complex needs, and th therefore they don't um, fall into um, the neat planning categories that maybe um, we've used uh, in the past. So I see a powerful model um, of locality uh, planning, building up and assessing local needs, creating the opportunity for a different type of relationship between and the public services and the other partners that I've talked about and the communities they serve, in turn, uh, flowing into a coherent strategic plan 
which will spell out um, the, the changes that are intended and, and a performance regime that will monitor uh, whether those changes are actually delivered. Uh, uh, Mr Ace, yes. Just following up from uh, Alan's point there, that, that probably is the key advantage for my system locally, um, is, is around the locality planning and the lo locality delivery um, of change. In health, we've probably centralised our decision making a little bit over the last uh, five years or so. And integration really gives us a critical mass back at the locality and the community level that we can sort of we can start to reverse some of that decision making power, uh, if you like, to bring in our particularly our GP community uh, very strongly into that decision making. And suddenly we get for for my system, it's four natural localities across the region that I can get um, a, a, that critical mass of real devolved decision making that we're quite optimistic about will be, will be a bit of a game changer for us. So I think whilst there's quite rightly been a lot of focus on the, on the top end of that corporate governance and around the, um, the body corporate model, it, it, it's actually, you need to flip it on its head to see the impact of this. And, it, and it's about localism and it's about far greater critical mass of decision making at a community level if this is actually going to work. And that, that's the bit that we can get our clinicians and, and partners quite excited about in a way that they're probably not excited about the machinations of the, the body corporate table. Okay. No? Well, that's, I mean, that's really interesting. Obviously, that, that was the intention of community health partnerships, but obviously it's not happened to, to the extent that it should have done. I mean, as, as I said, it was the acute sector that I was mainly wanting to ask about. And I suppose the worries that people have about any kind of integration is that it, it kind of reinforces horizontal uh, integration but weakens vertical integration within the health service so I'm really very interested in how the acute sector relates to this and I know some health boards well at least one health board has expressed concerns about that that it may you know almost lead to a, a separation of the body corporate from the acute sector and almost almost lead to a a kind of purchaser provider or commissioner provider relationship between the two so I, I would be a bit worried about that so I wondered how firstly how you see the acute sector relating to um, this model and I suppose the key question around that is how you see the, the financial power of the acute sector relating to this model. Okay, um, Mr Ace. Yeah, I think I'm in a very lucky position here um, because, again, I've, I've, as I've said, I've got one council um, coterminous with my boundaries. I've essentially got a, a relatively small acute service. I've got one uh, DGH and, and one large community hospital providing acute care. My plan is to bring the whole thing into the um, body corporate model so that we don't lose that integration of uh, between primary community and, and acute care. Uh, and that we're actually putting the whole, for us it's around about £250 million worth of health services into this partnership. Now, as I said, I, I think that's a, a function of, of luck, of the size of my system that I'm able to do that. It's a great solution locally, but I'm, I'm not sure it's one that transposes across Scotland with, with a far greater complexity and size of, of organisations there. Hey, Ms Mannion. Um, thank you. So linked into the, the, the my, my response is linked into the, the point Mr Chisholm made about um, uh, CHPs and, and localities, because I think that if you look at what was intended around the original uh, CHP uh, legislation, it was around improving the quality of what's provided locally, um, and it was about engaging, and it was about engaging with uh, uh, patients and service users as well as communities. And I think I have to say that there are significant areas where CHPs have been very successful, and I'd be anxious that the uh, integrated partnerships build on the successes. Where I think CHPs were less successful is in, in leading change across the system. Um, and I think that that is a fair criticism. And, but essentially, that's perhaps the lack of leverage to be able to do that. What this allows us to do in this, uh, the, this uh, uh, current draft is to be able to look at what the commissioning responsibilities will be for the partnership, which will allow us to be able to create change. I think that the argument about, and it is argument sometimes, about what's in and what's out, 
when it comes to acute has sometimes detracted from the reality of what we're actually trying to create. And it's absolutely essential that we get the links right between acute community and primary care services in order to engage our clinicians at a local level as well as our, our uh, specialist uh, clinicians. However, I think that it has become a distraction and many of the issues that we're facing across the country around trying to be able to, to look at organisational change has been, imp been impeded by those kind of debates. And perhaps some clarity around that one would be helpful. Thank you, Ms Mannion. Uh, Dr Gunning, did you want to come in? Yes, uh, please. Um, I think it's a really, really important question. Um, and I think it's maybe... Um, it's useful to clarify, I think, because um, Joint Strategic Commissioning, um, which is now the strategic plan, I think, has echoes of, is this a return to the internal market for, for the NHS? And, you know, is there a purchase provider split? And, you know, um, is there going to be an equivalent of NHS trusts and all the bureaucracy that go along with that? But uh, the Joint Strategic Commissioning process is really just something that's designed to, to bring about improvement, uh, you know, in terms of assessing needs um, and then um, uh, determining the best way to, to, to meet those needs and then ensuring um, that those um, services are delivered. Um, in Ayrshire, um, we have two district general hospitals um, and each provides um, services to, to residents of all three um, uh, partnerships in Ayrshire. So, uh, as Jeff said, in some places it doesn't um, uh, really support that, that, that sort of model. Um, but I think that uh, the important issue is what binds the partnerships and uh, acute services together. And it's, it's really the patient's pathway. Um, and so there needs to be a seamless flow between um, patients and, 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 uh, and, and, and users and carers in a, in a community setting through primary care, um, where appropriate, into hospital, and then um, discharge, and then re-enablement re and, and rehabilitation. And I think everybody knows that, um, but what's maybe been missing at the moment is, is a kind of process that binds all of that together. And for me, what binds it together is being very clear about the changes that you want to make. How, how are you actually going to shift the balance of care? And I think the strategic planning process makes that very transparent. Um, it should spell out what the partners um, are committed to doing to bring, an out, bring about a change. And then the resource implications of that um, should, should follow. Uh, and in principle, I don't see the change agenda um, in acute services and shifting the balance of care being any different from um, other areas of major service change that have occurred in the NHS over the last 20 years. So if you take the example of, of changes in mental health services, or perhaps more specifically, um, changes in learning disabilities service there, there was a clear policy outcome that there would be no longer any continuing care beds um, within the NHS for people with, with a learning disability. And the partners then got on to, to, to bring about the changes that would support that um, policy outcome. Um, and I think it's the same process that, that, that we'll have to work through um, between the partnerships and acute services. And my last point would be, in principle, I don't see the relationship between um, partnerships and acute services being any different from the relationship between the partnerships and, and major, major local authority services that are extremely relevant to the partnership agenda but are unlikely to be managed within it. Um, so education is probably the best example of that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gunning. Malcolm, do you want to come back in? No, I mean, that, that, was, that, was, that was very helpful. I mean, I, I just wonder if, if it is going to be different in the large health boards. I mean, there was one comment which I found quite interesting in a, in a kind of detailed kind of way at the end of the Ayrshire and Iron submission where you were saying, how is it going to work in terms of non-exec from health boards if they're sitting on lots of local authority partnerships? So that's maybe something that's, that will be a slight problem for Ayrshire, but it will be a much bigger problem for local authorities in Argyll and Clyde. So it's really just trying to work out how all that will, will work in practice that really interests, that interests me. But I suppose my final point really is, I mean, it's not really analogous with the mental health and the learning disability because the acute sector cannot be run down in any comparable way, not least because of the demographics. So I suppose that's where I'm, I'm still struggling to see how the, how the budgets are going to work. And in fact, one of the witnesses that's going to come on the next panel is going to argue that the budget should actually be centrally determined because you're really going to have great difficulty deciding A, how much goes in and B, what services are covered by it. 
No, I see. Um, I'm going to give preference to, to Mr Gray because he didn't get to speak in the last round of questions. But sure. if we, Mr Gray and then Dr Gunning, mm -hmm. and then we'll move on to the next the next question from MSPs. Mr Gray. Yeah. I recognise that's one thing we have to tackle right up front is we don't get so focused in, on, on the money because that, that clearly will be an issue we have to resolve in terms of how do we move resources. I think I would echo the points made by both Alan and, and Jeff around the importance of spending time getting the planning absolutely right. It's about integration of services, not only within the partnerships, but between the partnerships and the Cook Service. And we have to take time to work through. It's a strategic plan. It's going to have to have a horizon of five to ten years. Uh, and the important thing is we don't rush into making short-term decisions. We actually take the time to work out, actually, how would do we need to redesign our current uh, healthcare system to meet future demands that we're all facing? And we do need to change the way the hospital services are organised. So for me, the important decision we'll make is actually spending time up front in the early, early years of the partnerships, building confidence with one another, and, and building the strategic plans that allow us to see how we can move resources over time, because you have to, it takes time to move resources, because resources are currently invested in, in staff and in, in services, and it will take time to move these. But we need to have that vision, that strategic plan, that leadership that will allow us to make the changes that we do need to make to make a sustainable health uh, care system in Scotland for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Mr Gray. Dr Gunning? Yeah, I agree with Mr Ch Chisholm that the detail um, and the analogy maybe doesn't always hold, but what I was getting at was and learned disabilities and mental health, essentially we are shifting the balance of care. And it is one of the policy objectives um, to provide seamless services in, in the home or as homely um, a setting as possible. That's one of the policy objectives of the bill. And so I think in principle, um, it's the same um, uh, proposition that's before us. And all our partners will have to be very clear um, as to how that's um, going to be um, delivered. So that's really the point I was, I was trying to make. And I think, secondly, there is a distinction between um, total resource and the operational management of budgets. Um, I certainly wouldn't be in favour of starting to split up the operational management of budgets within district general hospitals. I, I just think, from my experience, that wouldn't work and it would become tremendously confusing. But we have to bear in mind that the, the vast majority of resources consumed within acute services um, are the consequence of um, decisions made particularly by colleagues in primary care. So that link has to be, I think, one that we, we strengthen, and I think there's the opportunity to do that. Okay, thank you, Dr Gunning. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Thank you. Can I just ask a supplementary on that before course, I yes. move, move on? And just listening to what you're saying, it, it kind of occurs to me that um, the body corporate is actually a whole new bureaucracy and at times of very tight um, restrictions on spending. You know, I can see how... Um, savings can be made by kind of incorporating better at ground level and sharing that. But setting up a whole new bureaucracy must have a cost associated with it in itself. Is that the case? Dr Gunning, yes. I wouldn't describe it as um, as, a, as a, a whole new bureaucracy. I think it's a it's a it's it's, a, it's to support um, I think uh, a new a new way of working, um, and so I, I think you have to look at the the sort of bigger pitch, picture and say um, what are the opportunities um, for um, shared services, um, and if I can I can show how structural change. Um, can support changes without organisational change. And I'll step outside the, the current discussion to talk about um, procurement as a function within the NHS. Within the NHS um, in the west of Scotland, all the, the, the boards have got together um, to um, procure things as a single body. So instead of doing it um, uh, five times, um, we do it once. And we've been able to make um, um, substantial savings as a consequence of that. But there's been no structural change in terms of land, line management reporting. And so I think that model is capable of being um, transported. Um, and, and how I think the body corporate can support um, a real change and, and improvement without leading to a big increase um, in bureaucracy. So I don't think it does automatically follow. But I do think the, the clearly setting up of the integration joint boards um, and the non-exec input to all of that, all of that has to be um, thought through. But my view would be um, keep the, the, those um, things that need to be put in place to an abs the absolute minimum that's required to support the change um, on the ground. And I think that's where all the things we've been talking about, locality planning, um, become important. 
Mr. Race wanted to come in on that road, my apologies. I, I think it's a very powerful challenge. Um, and I think we need to demonstrate to our local communities that the structures that we put in place do not create that bureaucratic cost. It is, it is, it would be a very hard sell for us to say to our population, the services that we were providing separately, we will now provide together, and it will cost us more in bureaucracy. That that is not a conversation I would like to have. So the onus is on us to make these systems work within our existing resources and our existing um, management and and leadership resource. It's it's a very um, it's a very strong challenge, I think, because the, on paper, the setup is now more complex than it was. So we have to find a simple way through that, that potential complexity that doesn't cost us more uh, suits on seats. That's, that's certainly a concern. Um, can I move on? Um, we had evidence last week um, from councils who were concerned about the breadth of the bill and that it didn't just focus on health and social care, but indeed could include any services that were being offered. Do you feel that the bill is right in that effect, that it, it is wider, or would you agree with them that it needs to be amended just to focus on health and social care? Okay, any comments on that? Um, Ms Mannion? I think it's, 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 a good, it's a good point, because I think that... You can, you can actually read quite a lot into the, the bill in its existing form about how what, what shape the organisational arrangements are and what's, what's in and what's out. Um, so very briefly in response to that, I think that we would be uh, seeking particular clarity, and I think that either comes centrally or locally, about what is meant by the issue around acute services, what's meant by... Uh, the, the uh, inclusion of unscheduled care and whether or not that's part of a commissioning budget or whether or not that's a provision budget. Because that, that breadthens, breadthens it out. I think that the discussion about the cor body corporate model gives an indication that it's very difficult to draw lines around older people services as such and therefore has to be broader because from an NHS point of view, primary care uh, community services is very difficult to separate out different chunks of how we deliver. What we've got to think about is how we do it locally together around GP practices linking into whole patient pathways of care. So I think it is, it is a crucial issue. Dr Gunning, did you want to come in on that? Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I think some of the specifics in the bill towards, towards the end of it um, around, um, again, um, the, the role of um, agencies that currently only provide uh, services to the NHS and, uh, and under the bill can provide services to um, wider stakeholders. Um, I think the spirit is trying to ensure that um, any potential barriers to integrated um, working um, are, are removed. Um, and I think it, they're designed to, to, to um, support um, integration. Um, I think the important point is that um, there's an appropriate balance between providing the statutory framework um, that's necessary, but allowing enough flexibility within that for, um, a, for local partnerships to operate in a way that best suits um, local circumstances. And that's always, I think, a difficult um, balance to strike. Um, I think, as we said earlier, if you look at some aspects of the bill in isolation, um, I think it may be seen that um, there's, there's um, residual powers um, within it that could be quite um, considerable um, if, um, if enacted. Um, and so, you know, it's, I think these are the issues that are before us and, and, and they're important issues. Do you have concerns about that or from, I suppose, from a health perspective, is that OK? I mean, I suppose if you look at local government, they cover a spectrum of services, um, not just social care, but, you know, beyond transport, housing, um, education, the whole, the, the whole lot. Um, do you have a concern in your own role in this about the, 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 the breadth of the bill? Um, within the issue, I don't think it's a, um, a concern um, that we have. I, we feel that the provisions of the bill... Um, on the health side, um, give enough flexibility um, for us to 
um, organised in such a way that we think is appropriate for um, uh, to support service delivery. So, for example, um, the fact that um, services um, beyond um, uh, services for adults can be included, if that um, is something that local partnerships feel would benefit those services, um, I think is, is welcome. Um, we clearly uh, would like to see um, a clarification on those services that must be included, those services that might be included, and those services that won't be included. Um, so I, I think, to be fair, um, there's still some further detail to come out probably in regulations um, that would help further inform the position for us. Susan, did you want to come in? Active participation. Uh, from integrated partnerships into local community planning arrangements and strategic community planning arrangements are going to be absolutely crucial because one of the things that I think the bill doesn't uh, uh, touch on uh, enough perhaps is thought around in health inequalities and how we're going to look at the whole shift towards prevention and dealing with inequalities. And there's a real opportunity here for partnerships to be key to part of that. So through the commissioning arrangements or through the existing planning arrangements, we need to be able to work much more closely with the colleagues outside just social work across the council because we need to be able to influence and look at transport, housing and the environment because all of that impacts on the inequalities. So the fact that it actually has a, a broader look at where a partnership would sit in relation to its planning partners is absolutely crucial. Okay. Um, Rhoda, do you want to come back in on that? Fine, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nanette Millen. Thank you. Um, I just want to f follow on from what's already been said about um, stakeholder involvement. Um, I mean, we have had concerns expressed to us, uh, particularly by the third and independent sectors, that there's very limited detail in the face of the bill about the involvement of stakeholders like that. And I sort of wondered what your, your thoughts were on that. <coughs> Sorry. And also, last week, um, we had some discussion about the role of GPs. And I mean, I think it is crucial that they are involved. I well remember when CHPs were set up, first of all, my own husband was a GP at that time, and um, so the disillusionment, they'd lost their localisation, if you like, and suddenly, instead of being a much smaller area, suddenly, well, the whole of Aberdeen, as it was, was the CHP. And I just wonder, in a fairly disillusioned profession, how you think, you, the, as a result of this bill, you'll be able to enthuse them and really get their involvement, because I think without that, it's not going to work. So I'd like your comments on that, please. So how this bill will motivate GPs? Who wants, <laughs> who wants to come in on that? Uh, uh, Mr. Ace. Yes, uh, GPs can do disillusioned very well. Um, I, th I think it goes, goes back to an, er an earlier argument about, around um, localities and communities. And I think I can, I can wrap in all stakeholders as well as GPs here. What um, clinical professionals, and I think a lot of third sector bodies find difficult to do is to engage with us on a regional basis because their ability to, uh, to act and to mobilise resources doesn't work in that way. They can, they can put different solutions in place in different areas. And I think the, the focus uh, of our integration, certainly locally, of being a, a decentralising integration where we achieve again, once again that, that critical mass at a locality area, so that's, that's far smaller than a, than a traditional CHP, CHP area, allows us to bring GPs in. We, we'll have a, a GP clinical lead for each of these localities and also to bring in the, the third sector and other organisations that are very active in that locality. And they may not be the same organisations um, in, in other localities. So I think that, that flexibility to create um, solutions that are tailored to, to a, a relatively small area and small number of communities is a real strength here. And hopefully, so far, that does seem to be raising enthusiasm amongst uh, clinicians and, and uh, other partners. Dr. Gunning? Yeah, I would support um, Jeff's uh, comments about uh, locality planning because I think under, if you go back far enough to local healthcare cooperatives, um, there's, there's, there's almost a kind of nostalgic um, look in the rear view mirror about how, um, how they work. But I think that the thing that binds it, to give a practical example that I heard one GP talking about, um, it's to make the agendas locally relevant um, 
to practice um, populations. Um, and so, for example, you know, uh, this particular GP said to me, we know there's necessary bureaucracy, you know, in the running of things. It's a public service, but actually we don't want to, you know, all of that can go on. What we want to have on the agenda is a debate about things like the quality of the incontinence service. You know, that's the kind of thing that's real to us. And if we can spend our time um, shaping that agenda, then um, it'll be worthwhile uh, uh, engaging with you. I think, secondly, in relation to um, one of the successes in the community health partnerships, I think, have, has been the, the role of public partnership forums. Um, not only um, in a, a CHP-related um, service change, but in the wider um, landscape of, of, of service change. Um, and I think it is, again, a point of, of clarification. It goes back to, to the other point that Susan made. I think we want to build on what has worked well um, on, on, on CHPs. And so there's, 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 um, uh, there's mechanisms like that. And in Ayrshire, particularly, some of the, um, um, the, the forums that we have supporting the CHP committees that has that wider stakeholder engagement um, has worked well. And as, as I said earlier, I think in terms of the engagement of um, the third sector and the independent sector, um, we have a model in, in the Joint Services for Older People and the Joint Strategic Commissioning process for that um, that seems to have worked well. Um, and again, I think um, those particular sectors want to build on that strategic um, input. And I think, I think we can do that. I think we can build on, on, on what's already working. Susan Mannion. Yes, I think the uh, uh, discussion about the whole uh, clinical pathway, the whole care pathway for individual patients is absolutely crucial because the GPs and clinicians are most interested in the patients in front of them and what they can do in order to make uh, uh, life better for them. And a lot of that is about having some influence over how to change things, whether or not it's incontinence services, whether or not it's about referral patterns into into more specialist services. That's what GPs are interested in. And I think that linking in with other clinicians locally through the models that are starting to emerge is, is extremely helpful and hopefully will help them to become more engaged in what we're trying to do. Thank you, Susan. Nanette, do you have a follow-up? Just do, 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 do any of you think that there should be more on the face of the bill, more detail about <coughs> particularly the, the third and independent sectors? Um, which, because we have had a significant amount of evidence saying that they, they, they feel that there should be. Mr. Ace? What I would probably not want to see is, is a requirement for third independent sector um, bodies to be represented on committee XYZ or on, on board ABC, I, I think that could be a lot of um, a lot of commitment for them for, for relatively little um, actual advantage. Where we need them to work with us is, as has been said, is, is on actual service provision, is on the local solutions that we can put in place, rather than having perhaps a, a, a tokenistic presence, a, a regional-wide committee that is not going to play to their strengths. We'll be speaking to the third sector in our next, in our next witness session. On that specific point, does anyone else wish to make a comment? Hey, Dr Gunning. I would just say I, I think it, that, that it is important to get that positive engagement, and, and I say I think we have have a, a model, um, but I think the arrangements have to to follow the governance and accountability um, arrangements. I think we have to be very very clear um, of that distinction between um, strategic involvement and where the responsibility lies um, at the end of the, uh, of the day, um, which is going to lie with the statutory partners. So I think you know. Um, that's a distinction we have to draw, and I think it's an important one to be fair to colleagues in uh, the third and independent sectors. Um, Gil Patterson had a supplementary. It's actually on that point, the yeah, convener. And it's quite clear there's a status uh, thing happening at the same time. You have the health board and uh, local authorities, and the budget's coming together. So that effectively gives the two big organisations the status. And yet we know the third sector delivers a lot eh, on the ground. So it's how do we give the third sector the voice and the status uh, and, you know, and get the best out of them. We have the third sector coming in, as the convener said, so maybe it's more appropriate for them. I'm sure they'll get something to say on it, but I'd like a wee bit more if you could say how we engage and how we get the best 
from the third sector to, to be involved and make this work happen and work. And I think they're sitting just behind you, so their ears are probably burning right now. <laughs> would, 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 de, would anyone like to come in on that, Mr Gray? So I think Jeff raised the point at the start, we actually turn it on its head, actually what we're talking about is actually putting locality planning at the front, actually, and supporting it with some you know, strategic frameworks around which we can do that. And that would success, but we've got to make it a success. We do need to engage with the third sector, we need to engage with the public in terms of looking after their own healthcare. We need to empower communities to involved in decisions that affect them. We've got assets uh, dotted all over our, our health board areas that could be better used by the community and to make the community more part of that. So I think it's part of us as leaders of the health service to make sure that we do engage at a locality level, make it meaningful engagement at a locality level. Mm -hmm. And go back to a bit about GPs as well. GPs' biggest frustration is actually to make connections even within the health system. So it's, it's making it easy for them to make connections with the public, but also when they wish to admit people to services within the acute sector, that there is a point of contact, there's a face, a person, a known point of contact. Uh, and there's a whole range of work, bits of work being done already around trying to integrate GPs into the whole uh, health system and also as part of the integrated uh, health and partnership, health care partnership, I should say. Thank you very much, Mr Gray. If, with your indulgence for time constraints, I think I'm going to move on to the next question by MSP. So it's Mark McDonald followed by Aileen. Uh, thank you, convener. I'm going to be shamelessly parochial, but I think it will be relevant to the to the legislation nonetheless. And um, Mr. Gray possibly knows where this is going to go. Um, there have been concerns expressed about the um, decision by Aberdeen City Council to establish an arm's length company, a local authority trading company, for the delivery of some of its social care services. Um, and the chief executive of NHS Grampium was on the record saying that there was, uh, while this doesn't um, prevent integration, it could restrict the range and nature of the partnership that is established in the Aberdeen area. Looking at how the legislation is drafted, and given that the, the, the things have moved on now and the council has now established that, what discussions have taken place and do you feel confident that the, the partnership will be able to work to the maximum benefit? I guess, without going into details, I think we've, we've got to recognise the department. It's been set up, the local training company, it's been set up. I reviewed it actually, it's, it's, a, it's a service delivery vehicle. It delivers services, it's for, it will be service, it'll be commissioned by the integrated authority. So I don't think it makes it any more difficult. I think there are, uh, you, it's different from what we've got within <coughs> the other two local authority areas that we're working with. But I think if we take a sensible approach with the City Council, I don't think it's a prohibitor uh, to progress around the integration agenda. We've just got to understand what the vehicle is there to do. It's there to achieve a, a range of objectives for the Council, but I don't see it as, an, as something that would necessarily get in the way of effective partnership working within the City uh, of Aberdeen. Uh, so I think that discussion has moved on, Mark, I think, from the, the various correspondence that's been exchanged. I think we now recognise what it's there to do. There's been a positive engagement between uh, officials in the Health Board uh, and the Council. I think for us to spend time now on the strategic plans of which the trading company will be part of because it will be delivering part of the service to the Commission in the same way that some of our operational services within the Community Health Partnership currently provide services. So I wouldn't see it as a prohibitor. I don't think the, the legislation needs to address that specifically. I think it for us, it's for us to work through the detail of that as part of the joint commissioning uh, arrangements. Mark, can I just say to you if, you, I mean, if you want to follow up on that, that's valid, but if you could be uh, just well, brief specifically I'm, on that, because there's a wider issue about structures with the bill. Well, well, this, is, well yeah. this is the point I'm coming to, is that looking at this legislation and comparing it to previous legislation where, for example, uh, local authorities have established arm's length organisations, which it often is found don't necessarily uh, find themselves captured by legislation. Um, do you feel that within the, the current framework of legislation, this sort of approach is captured? I think the governance remains with the, the integrated authority. So that's where governance and, and, and the decisions around the planning and the provision of services lies. Uh, it's for that group of individuals when they come together to determine how the, the trading company forms part of uh, and what services will be commissioned through that. I mean, it's that, that decision is still to be worked through, but I don't think it should stop. Uh, um, one further question, if I may, convener, and that is, um, obviously, um, we're focused very much on the governance uh, and the accountability issues as part of the legislation, but the, the driver behind this is to improve the delivery of service to individuals um, uh, and, uh, you know, pe people in receipt of care. Um, with that, I'm aware that there are long-standing issues in some areas um, 
in relation to, for example, recruitment of carers, um, areas around that. How do you see closer working um, and potentially looking at things like workforce? Um, do you see that, any of the panel see that as having a, a positive impact in terms of uh, improving the situation in areas where perhaps there is a difficulty uh, in recruiting appropriate care professionals. I don't think that's specifically directed at yourself, Mr. Legree. You're welcome no, to answer. No, that's it. I, th I yes, think it's back to, to others if they want to come in. Also, Sorry, Mr. Uh, Legree. Yes, it's just a point I made earlier about actually looking ahead. We've got to actually now design a health system that can be delivered within the constraints of our various local markets, and each of us face different difficulties. So I think it's for us to to design the system that recognises where these challenges are. Uh, and actually we then look to work together to find a way forward that actually recognises that there will be challenges around recruitment for, per se as, as one example, but we need to find a way of actually working our way through that so we can come up with a system that is sustainable, it's attractive for people to work in and recognise these challenges within the local areas. Okay, Dr Gunning and then Susan Mannion. I think um, viewed from the, the perspective of carers, one of the, the potential uh, advantage in terms of workforce change um, as, as fewer handoffs between services um, in terms of health and social care staff working um, uh, as part of a single team. Um, people talk about conversations over the kettle and I think if you can uh, get um, those teams particularly co-located in a single area it, it, um, it enhances um, the team working outcomes and, and, and uh, the involvement um, of carers. I think there is a big sort of human resources and organisational development strategic agenda here but we need to build on things where we've already been successful so for example um, joint um, training and child protection um, there are think, um, things that we can build on so that um, we're developing the workforce in a way that's coherent and uh, consistent and appropriate. Susan Mannion. Thanks. I think that was a, a, a point that we missed earlier in answering the question about the potential added value of the new legislation, and that's workforce planning uh, linked to the, the sort of uh, resource change that needs to happen. Because at the end of the day, we still have in our existing arrangements, we still have different care workers, home care workers, and health care workers going into people's home and sometimes there's still gaps and overlaps in what's being provided. So if we can work to be able to plan that and deliver that more effectively, taking into account the HR issues, then that, that is a, a significant added value and that's, that's what excites us about the new legislation. Thank you. Mr. Ace, you wanted to come in, yes? Just to, to link back to a previous question, I think, I think it's important for us to realise that the, the bulk of carers are not coming from the statutory agencies. You know, these are being provided by, by families and by uh, third sector organisations and, and this is the sort of area where each system has got to demonstrate its effective working with other partners um, at very low level, at very community based level, at family based level and that's the, the, going to be the, the quality of the engagement with the third sector and other partners that's going to determine whether this bill actually demonstrates Im improvement. So I think carers is a really useful example where actually all of, the, all of the solution isn't with the statutory agencies here. Maybe most of the solution isn't with the statutory agents. And it's going to, a lot of our success is going to be driven by the quality of our engagement with our non-statutory partners. Dr Gunning, you want to come back in? Yeah, yeah, just briefly, I think there is a wider strategic um, agenda in terms of links back to the Christie Commission report and in particular how um, public services reshape um, the, the relationships with, um, with local communities and I think that's central um, to all of this. And there's already, um, for example, in East Ayrshire, a Vibrant Communities Programme, which is a very structured programme through community councils um, addressing that, that very issue. And here, if, if we have a concern um, in Ayrshire, it's about some of the links, the links between this bill and the Empowering Communities Bill. Um, we've clearly got legislation going through and, and children's um, services too. And so I think there is, um, there is a responsibility to make sure that these three, these just given specific examples, that they all are consistent and, and lead to the same um, outcome that, that we all want to see. But if there is a concern that's maybe around some of those linkages, because there will be overlaps quite legitimate, um, we need to make sure they are positive overlaps and we're not pulling things, either duplicating or, or we're still pulling things in different directions. Mark, do you want to come back in on that? No, I think that covers it. Okay, thank you. Aileen McLeod. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. And um, 
I think all the questions I was uh, hoping to ask um, have already been um, asked and answered, um, particularly around the, um, how we actually encourage you know, sort of real and meaningful involvement of our third and independent sectors, our users and carers within the, the design, um, you know, development and the implementation um, of our services. Um, but feel free, if there's anything that you haven't already said, um, to put it on the record, but I'm conscious that in Dumfries and Galloway, um, there is the Community Health and Social Care Partnership Board, which does include representatives from the third and independent sectors on that project board. And there's also, again, of course, the, the Putting You First um, programme. Of course, my safety net question was on the workforce uh, planning um, and training so that we can help build the capacity in the community. But of course, these have also um, been answered uh, already. So uh, the question I will ask, uh, coming back to the bill, is to do with the um, complaints and patient rights that um, I understand at the present time uh, our local authorities and health boards operate entirely separate uh, complaints uh, procedures uh, and in addition our NHS health boards have to comply with the Patient Rights Scotland Act 2011 which obviously sets out the rights and responsibilities of patients using NHS services. Um, so can I ask um, HMU to sort of say how do you envisage uh, the complaint systems and the Patient Rights Act, how they will, will work within integrated services um, that are meant to appear seamless from the perspective of the users? I think just for yes. a moment the witnesses thought they were getting a blank sheet of paper to see whatever they liked, but we've got a very focused question now, so <laughs> any, any takers on that? Uh, Mr Ace, yes. For the bulk of the pathways, I think it will still be very clear mm -hmm. under which process the, the patient or client, will, uh, their complaint will be dealt with. I think increasingly, and, and maybe if you think three or four, five years down the line, that there will be a blurring at a, a, a community care, at a care in the home level, between what is actually health and what is social care provision. And that's when that question becomes very difficult to answer as to, as to which, which of the, the discrete processes we would use. And we, and we may, at that point, need to come to some sort of different landscape around complaints management. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gunning. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's right, and and already, um, you know, some complaints do cross um, agencies just in the nature of things, and the agencies have to work together to um, address those. I think perhaps there'll be a need to to formalise those arrangements um, a wee bit more. But but can I use the question to build on another point that we that we haven't covered that I'd like to make? Um, because complaints leads into ombudsman and, and, and so on. Um, and I think it is really important that the scrutiny agencies go with the grain in terms of the changes that, um, uh, that we're trying to make. Because again, the last thing we want to do is um, find that we've, we've got, and I know there's, there's thought being given to, to, to joint scrutiny um, arrangements, but the last thing we want, going back to the earlier point about bureaucracy, is for scrutiny to take place individually and then collectively, and before we know where we are, um, the, the, the burden on uh, frontline services um, increases. I think that's the last thing we would want. So certainly I think it's important the scrutiny agencies go along with uh, the grain of um, the policy objectives of the bill. Anyone else on that specific point? Um, Aileen? Um, what about also in terms of the, um, the Patient Rights um, Scotland Act? Because obviously at the moment um, that's primarily aimed at you know, patients using NHS services. So do you think that should be extended to cover social care services also? Mr. H. <laughs> yes. um, both, if, if you look at um, a client within social care framework or a patient within an NHS framework, both have um, a framework of um, uh, rights guaranteeing legislation. So I, I don't think there's a gap at the moment. And I, and I think your question is, is, should we continually blur the line between the two and, and make one, one the dominant uh, culture, if you like. I don't think there's an urgency around that. And, I, and I, I, I think at the moment it is clearly understood where, for example, the Care Commission's responsibilities start and finish and where um, uh, um, HIS come in, come in from, a, from a, health improve, a health point of view. So I think we have clarity and so there is no gap at the moment. It, it may be one for the future, but I, I don't think there's an urgent problem there. Okay, uh, I'm 
Ms Mann, were you wanting in there? Uh, Dr Gunning? I was just going to say um, some of the provision in terms of the current uh, patients' rights legislation very much focus on um, access times within, within acute services. Um, so the 12 weeks treatment time guarantee. Um, and so whether in future there will be further um, statutory underpinning um, around um, access times, I think, is, is, is a major policy issue. Uh, but certainly I see many of the challenges within current legislation um, are in the direction of um, guaranteed access times, which are really, really important. Uh, Aileen? Anything else? Now, now, Gail Patterson, I know you had a supplementary on that, but you're also the next person to, to ask a question. You've been very patient, so off I, you go. Like Eileen, most of the questions that I've wanted to raise have already been covered. But uh, uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, uh, Gunning said that um, that you had you know, like conversations with pe people over a, a kettle. I was born and raised in Springburn, and we used to try and have conversations with people over a barrel. <laughs> so I think your idea is much better than the way I was uh, brought up. <laughs> uh, but Mr. Patterson, representing Springburn, things have moved on a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. I don't live there any longer. <laughs> um, no, it was with regards to, I think you, you were talking, you know, when Aileen raised the idea of two different, I think it's, it is a, is a, a serious question, having two different uh, systems for people to complain, but I would maybe suspect that what you're saying is that it should organically change, that in the future that there will be a coming together, and maybe putting some of that effort and resources in at this time would, in, in fact, make it fail. Maybe commenting that would be fine. We will always be able to answer a complaint, but between us, between ourselves and the Council, we will find a mechanism, as we do now, when a, an individual crosses our organisation. So there is no urgent um, uh, necessity for, for legislation on this, I don't think. Okay, Any other witnesses want to comment <clears throat> on that, Mr Patterson? No, that's fine, thanks. I've had enough. <laughs> oh, right, OK. It's not often that MSPs are, are, are without a comment to make at this stage. Um, can I perhaps give the opportunity, just briefly, because time is starting to uh, get ahead of us, if there's something that any of our witnesses wanted to put on the record here this morning that you don't feel you've been asked about, now would be your opportunity to do that. Um, is there anything you would like to add? Oh, oh here we go. Yes, we'll go Miss Mannion and then Mr Ace. Yes. Well, uh, uh, speaking from the uh, CHP Association, of course, saying this is uh, like um, turkeys voting for Christmas, I mean, I think we are delighted with the opportunities that are presented through integrated partnership. When one's called to give evidence, you're c considering the kind of issues that are missing or the bits that we want to, to emphasise. But I think that what we do appreciate is the thrust around the change. We recognise that this is coming off the requirement to be, to, for us to be, to be bold and to use the opportunities. I think locally we're keen to be bold and to use the opportunities and we just need to make sure that we actually make some step changes now to be able to build on what has been successful. But there is so much more that we can do together, but we need the legislation to help us to be able to do it. Otherwise, we would have done a lot of it before. Very helpful, Ms Mannion. Thank you, Mr Ace. And just picking up on the third sector point that was, that was raised earlier, I, th I think it is important to re-emphasise that, that every system will need to make their local third sector engagement work in a way that, that, that's dramatically different perhaps to how it's worked so far. And we need to be uh, assessed on the quality of how well that works. What, what I think I'm thoughtful of and some of my health colleagues are thoughtful of, of is how you effectively legislate for that in a way that works for Glasgow or works for rural Dumfries and Galloway. And I think that that's the bit that we're thoughtful about, not the, the realisation that we are going to have to radically change the level and quality of our engagement with uh, third sector and other partners. Thank you, Mr. It's been Dr. Gunning or Mr. Gray want to add anything, Dr. Gunning? And just two, two very brief points, you know, and I think it is around, although we're talking about structures and governance and accountability, um, you know, integration is not an end in itself. It's really just a, a mechanism for improving outcomes um, for the people in, in local communities um, that we serve. And I think equally, legislation um, can't do it alone. 
Um, and I think there are big leadership challenges um, at all levels, I think, um, nationally um, as well as locally and within and out with um, the statutory agencies. And so I think we need to be aware of the, the organisational development and wider um, change agenda and the leadership that's going to be required at, at, at all levels to make this a success. Thank you very much. Mr Grey, do you want to understand the relationships between the strategic plans that we are undertaken by both the Council and the Health Board and integrated uh, plans that we produce by each of the partnerships. It's important to understand how all that will work together because as a board that serves more than just uh, one council area, it's important to actually recognise that a lot of our services are organised across our region, indeed across the north of Scotland. It's just important to actually get the right uh, balance between the planning decisions at a strategic level across a board area uh, and those uh, strategic planning decisions at uh, an integrated authority level. And if the legislation can simplify that, as Jeff said, in terms of the governance and accountability, that will be ever so helpful in terms of making sure that actually we do uh, meet the right outcomes and deliver what uh, we're required to do under the new arrangements. OK, thank you very much. Can I remind witnesses that uh, our scrutiny of this piece of legislation will be ongoing? And if there's anything you want to add in writing, please do as... Uh, as the committee continues to take evidence. In fact, we would find that helpful. We would welcome that. So all that we want to do is to thank uh, all four of you for your time here this morning, and we'll suspend briefly for five minutes whilst we get our next set of witnesses. Thank you.
Okay. Okay, we now continue with agenda item two, which is taking evidence on the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Bill. And I welcome our second panel. So can I welcome Ranald Mayor, Chief Executive of Scottish Care, Nigel Henderson, Convener Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland, and Martin Syme, Chief Executive Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. As with the, the, the first group of witnesses, um, we're going to go straight to questions to allow uh, more time, and Gil Patterson has intimated uh, he'd like to ask the first question. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to see you all here. Um, I, I would like to start where I finished, well, not quite where I finished, but when I raised, uh, you know, when I followed my colleague on stakeholder involvement, and I know that the voluntary sector, uh, you know, it's evident that the, the voluntary sector do want to be involved in this, and I think I used the the kind of phrase with the two big beasts involved in this, uh, that there is status, automatic status. So I wonder just how, how you would see, you know, how do you engage and, you know, what would you like to see from the bill itself and, and, and how, what's your input here and how, how do we get your status to that same level, if that's at all possible, without what? money coming into the frame? Uh, whilst I did say to the last panel, not every witness has to answer every question, I've got a feeling all three of you will wish to answer this question. Uh, Mr. Syme, can we start off with yourself? Um, thanks very much. I mean, kind of gets to the heart of one set of concerns we've got um, ab about the bill, because the bill clearly sees the sector in the kind of um, secondary um, um, role in terms of the institutional um, aspects and, and also in terms of the evidence that you've just heard. Um, I think there's still a widespread view that we're just there to deliver other people's priorities. And I think that's a misunderstanding and misrepresentation of the sector's role and its many different interests in this um, field and the critical kind of roles it has to play. Um, we understand why um, the, 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 the bill is structured the way it is with um, an equal number of representatives from the two big public service beasts because that's about balance of power. And we recognise that if the third sector had a voting seat at that table, it would in effect hold the balance of power. <laughs> and I think that, uh, but uh, I think it was uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance who said at a recent briefing with the third sector that if it gets to the point where you've got to vote, then people have missed the point altogether. And I do think that that is, um, you know, a, a fair reflection of the problem um, associated with third sector representation. So we would like to see the third sector represented at all levels. In, in the new structures. If we're going to have these new structures, it's important that the third sector gets a seat at the strategic tables, because I think it does have a strategic contribution to make to this bill, not just to the, ob to the objectives of this bill. Um, we do um, um, recognise that uh, if, if there is to be this um, um, voting by statutory agencies only on the, I think, rather odd um, reasoning that we've heard so far that they are statutory res statu statutorily responsible um, for public money, then um, the third sector and other interests should have some power of veto over the plans and how they are developed. Uh, it should, they should certainly have a right to contribute to those plans. Um, we would also like to see in the context of this, and I know, Jill, you said it wasn't about, about money, but there, there needs to be a, an investment, a, a modest investment in the third sector's capacity to engage with all these structures. Um, otherwise, you're simply um, asking hard-pressed volunteers and voluntary organisations to stop doing something else in order to engage in um, um, statutory planning, if you like. So there needs to be some investment there. Um, but most of all, we would argue it's not about structures, it's actually about... Um, building stronger communities, which will take the strain and the pressure away from all this um, focus on the delivery of care services to people. Um, if we don't do stuff, if we don't do things that reduce demand on formal services, um, then we're kind of missing the point. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, thank you. Uh, I wasn't sure whether the reference to two big beasts was a reference to Mr. Syme and Mr. Henderson, but. <laughs> I, 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 um, as you know from the written evidence that we've submitted, Scottish Care is clear that this, is, this will be a missed opportunity if the third and independent sector are not fully included uh, in, the, uh, in, 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 the, in the governance arrangements going forward. That's the position that we've enjoyed and discharged responsibly within the change fund and reshaping care work to date. Those partnerships are four-way partnerships 
with the with the third and independent sectors having sign off uh, responsibilities within that, and those have been those that has created a sense of joint ownership of the delivery of care and of the development of new models of care going forward. The bill actually, rather than capturing the progress that has been made, dangerously sets us back to a point where the, the third and independent sectors become consultees, people to be consulted with, not full partners in a process. And despite the optimism expressed by Dr Gunning and others in the previous session, I think there is a real danger of us losing ground rather than making it. And if you also, from the evidence that we submitted, it's clear that in terms of social care, more social care delivery is in the third and independent sector than in the statutory sector. Uh, if you look at care homes, you look at care at home, those services are, 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 are the, the, the bulk of those services are delivered by third and independent sector organisations. So, how can you have an integration of service delivery? What we've created, I mean, in a sense, and, and, and in an honest way, the title of the bill says this is about the joint working of statutory bodies. That's what it is. It's, we've given up on integration. As you know from, the, uh, uh, from our written evidence, we would have preferred that this was a public services bill where everybody that is part of the delivery of public care were coming together and the focus was on the in, th that level of integration. So certainly we very strongly feel that, uh, that, we, that the third and independent sector has to be represented at all, all levels of, of governance and planning in order that we're not at the commissioned end of service delivery, but we are uh, wholly part of that process from the outset. Mr Henderson. I think a lot has been said that, that, that I would certainly echo, but I think particularly it's interesting to note that where we are today and what part the third sector has played in that, an awful lot of what is delivered across the country was pioneered, innovated, created by third sector organisations, and this is now part of the mainstream. It's also interesting when you look at the push within the health service just now to move to a person-centred way of working. So the health service are playing catch up with where the voluntary sector has been for the last 20 years. We have a significant contribution to make, not just as providers, but as equal partners. You know, I think it's interesting to reflect that we are trusted to provide care and support to some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland, but we're not trusted or respected as equal partners. And I, you know, I absolutely echo what both Martin and Ranald have said, that, that we need to be involved at all levels. The mechanics of that, how we sort it out, we can get to later, but the basic premise has to be involvement. And again, the third sector doesn't always speak with one voice. We are a very diverse range of organisations. We have a diverse range of interests, but we do then have a range of interests that, that crosses across the whole community within Scotland and at different levels. So very important that we don't just leave the two big statutory authorities to this themselves. They need people like us to help shape and create and innovate the desired outcomes. Okay, thank you. Gail, do you want to come back on yeah, that? Just, uh, I hear what you're saying uh, uh, and, and, and the way you're delivering uh, this message. Uh, is there any kind of practical uh, items that you can bring to the table that kind of encapsulates what you're trying to achieve, remembering that you just said that the voluntary sector and the third sector is so wide in its range and how it delivers and where it delivers? How, how, do, you, how do you bring all that together before you kind of... Can I Mr. Mayor, part some power to, 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 it, to just one example because when uh, the, the had been asking questions in the previous session about, for instance, the decisions that GPs make and why people end up in hospital sometimes, and that's because the GP can pick up the phone and get access to a hospital place if they're worried about Mrs. Smith. They cannot get immediate access to an intensive care at home package, they cannot get immediate access to a care home place. The purpose of integration is to bring all the options to, to the fore so that in making some of those decisions, <laughs> uh, people have immediate access. If you leave the, 
the, the pr provider sector to something that has to be commissioned uh, th you know, through the, the social work department, then you don't have that immediacy of access, you don't bring all the options to bear, you don't redesign the systems effectively. Um, so it seems to me that, as, that there is some very practical ways in which the provider sector and the, the uh, private, both private and voluntary have to be part of that planning and that as I say, bringing of options together at, uh, in, in, in the front line. Martin Sain? Uh, yeah, um, there's, there's a bit of a track record here. I mean, the government makes a significant investment in what's called third sector interfaces. None of us like the, um, like the name very much, but the, but the intent is, is very clear, which are local umbrella bodies, which are designed to provide a framework through which the third sector can cooperate. If you think about um, health and care, and we've already had examples um, of all the different kinds of roles that the third sector can play as a, a kind of vehicle for user carer and community groups, as a kind of advocate for special interests and people with disabilities, as a service provider, um, it's clearly quite difficult for any one organisation to, in a traditional sense, represent all of that diversity into statutory planning processes. Um, but in the community planning world, we're, we're, we're working towards, and we're making real progress, I think, with the TSIs, um, a, a situation where the representative role is to enable messages from the diversity of interests in the sector to be represented at the table and to be reflected into those discussions. And, and crucially, and just as importantly, for the, for the messages from the, the community planning table to come back to that diverse constituency in the community. In other words, the role isn't to represent a block of interest. The role is to act as an interlocutor and to um, bring messages back and forth from, from what are really quite diverse sets, sets of interests. Now, we could do that role in health and care. Um, but we can't do it from a standing start and with no resources. And I think that's, that, that would be my message to you. It's, so, so, and it requires a very clear message to the statutory partners that this is not an optional extra or something that should be left to local decision making. Because we know what happens when it's left to local decision making is that in large parts of the country it doesn't happen. Yeah, so my question... So, sorry, then, Mr Henderson, did, sorry. you didn't catch my ID one in there? Well, well uh, sorry, you know, I, I think okay. that the, the question was more specific, I think, about how do we actually do this, I, I think. So, um, and I don't have a, a snappy answer, but I, I do reflect on what Martin said, that we already have community planning structures, and yes, sometimes involvement, you know, certainly... From my point of view, I sometimes find that as a service provider, it's quite difficult to engage with. But equally, I understand that we have third sector representation there. But I also think that integration and community planning, there has to be some discussion about how these two things link up as well. Because we could set off lots of committees, structures, and all the rest of it. And I do worry about this sort of... Uh, um, how we as a sector then make sure that we are represented. We, we think we're entitled to be represented and to be part of this, but actually, as Martin says, how do we resource that? And I think there are already frameworks within community planning that could actually feed in to health and social care integration as well, so that actually you are listening to what is happening from the ground up. And then, so therefore, from your own perspective, to make that happen, to must there be a reference to that on the face of the bill, or does it, does it, in, in guidance, does it work in guidance? I, I think it's a strongly held principle. Uh, it's within the policy memorandum. I don't see why it shouldn't be on the face of the bill. Where do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think to strengthen that, I mean, I think it is at the moment. If you read the bill, you wouldn't know that the third and independent sector existed or contributed anything. Uh, uh, so uh, the policy, there is a di there's a disconnect between the policy memorandum and the bill in this regard, that we are already core partners, we need to continue to be core partners, and some reference to that on the face of the bill means that it's, it cannot be left to any local opt-out or, or whatever. It becomes a formal requirement for, a, for, the, uh, for that inclusiveness. There are partnerships where it would happen anyway. I do believe that. And I think, you know, I say that was being reflected a lot by Dr Gunning 
happening in the previous session. He was saying, well, in, you know, in, in Ayrshire, we would do this, and, and, and that's fine. But actually, there might be some other parts of the country where the choice was not to do it or not to do it well enough. Uh, so I think it does have to be on the face of the bill. Bill, anything? I mean, there's a few members no, want supplementary. If the members will indulge me, I've got a supplementary myself in relation to this. Mr. Syme, I, I think you said it to, to, to challenge our views. You said that if it's about equal partners, we'll get local authorities, we'll get health boards, and if the voluntary sector was there, in effect, you could perhaps hold the balance within any strategic board. Um, I'd be interested to know what you thought the balance of influence would be in relation to the third sector on any strategic board should should you sit on it in terms of uh, voting rights and in terms of, of, of the input. So, and, and, and more importantly, if you believe something should be on the face of the bill, uh, the face of the bill has got a great deal of flexibility in terms of what that body corporate, for example, may look like. Uh, would you be seeking to have an... I don't mean this glibly at all, but a nod to the third and independent sector, or would you like to micromanage on the face of the bill? <laughs> I, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. What, what the role of it should be? I'm interested to get a bit more clarity I'm, around that. I, I mean, to start with, I wouldn't start from here. I mean, the bill is primarily um, uh, an object lesson in 14 public bodies j coming together with 32 other public bodies to create 32 new public bodies. And I mean, that's, you know, effectively what it is. So the third sector's interest in that kind of um, institutional um, arrangement is necessarily limited. The third sector's um, engagement, as my colleagues have um, reiterated, in the delivery of health and care services and in the promotion of uh, initiatives in the community which might obviate the need to use those services is absolutely central. And if we don't get our heads around a set of priorities that puts that second domain uh, above the first domain, then we've kind of lost the plot. It seems to me um, we started on this journey because Scotland's facing significant demographic um, challenges. Um, what I worry about is the conversation is no longer about the significant demographic challenges and how to how to meet them. It's about the institutional arrangements in a piece of public sector infrastructure. Um, but if the message is you can have all this public sector infrastructure without engagement at, at, of the third sector, um, then I would have to say, of course not. So, so my argument to you is the third sector needs to be seen as an established partner, not as a downstream deliverer of public sector um, uh, priorities. And if we're not an established partner, and if we're outside this particular tent, it will become a very uncomfortable tent to be in altogether because um, the third sector will make its voices and interests known in, in other ways. So um, I, I don't actually have an answer to, this, to, the, to the dilemma that, that is faced here. I can understand why local government and health are equally unwilling to cede a, seat, a, a voting seat at the table um, because of the power that will give to the third sector. I think the third sector would be very ill-advised to just grab such a seat. So um, my message is a bit mixed. I would like to see on the face of the bill a recognition of the absolutely pivotal role that the third sector plays in supporting people and communities uh, and the need to engage with the, uh, for all public authorities to engage with the third sector at every level um, on an equal footing. Okay, thank you. I, I, I should not miss this. Maybe we'll let you in a second, but I, sh I should know in terms of the structures underpinning this bill, what we're trying to get to is making sure the third and independent sector are part of the strategic planning at the earliest phase, which is about meeting the outcomes for, 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 for individuals in, in our communities. So, Mr Mayor, in terms of the bill, because we are looking at the nuts and bolts of the bill, I hope you'll appreciate that, how you would like to see that adapted or changed or modified. I mean, I accept that there are aspects of governance and accountability that the statutory agencies specifically have. The accountability back to local elected members, the accountability health boards back to ministers. I mean, I, so I accept that, that the third and independent sectors are not in exactly the same position. That does not, however, mean that we can't be full strategic partners uh, and be in a kind of non-exec role within, uh, with, with, within, within local boards. Because I think when it comes to 
uh, I'd say the strategic needs assessment in given areas, the development of locality plans, the options appraisal of how services can best be delivered. You could not do that work effectively without the inclusion of the uh, uh, of the third and independent sector, uh, and uh, so so I think it's it's not beyond us to come up with a governance model which allows that strategic uh, inclusion, uh, but whilst accepting that the statutory agencies have particular particular lines of accountability in relation to the uh, to public monies, etc. Okay, that's helpful, Mr. Henderson. Well, I mean, I, th I think, you know, there are three potential levels of involvement. So one is at the sort of uh, health and social care board level, one is at the strategic commissioning process, and one is at the locality planning level. I think we should be involved at all levels. I think being involved early in any strategic planning is absolutely crucial. So if there is a way that the bill can actually um, reflect that, that says that this must have involvement from the third and independent sectors at that point, then that, I think, is uh, where we'd like to see some changes. Um, the, whether we have voting rights at board level, in an ideal world, that might be useful. But actually, as Martin already said, hopefully you have a process that allows for consensus to arise and you don't actually have to wave votes around um, because people are actually sharing the same vision and the same agenda about integrating health and social care. Now we had two supplementaries on that from Aileen McLeod and Richard Lyle. Um, yeah, thanks, convener. Um, Martin Syme, I know you had said at the beginning that this wasn't about um, the structures, but about building um, stronger communities. And obviously, in the, the submission that you've uh, sent to the committee, uh, you mentioned about the capacity implications for the third and independent sector, and also in terms of the fact that the operating environment for the third sector uh, remains uh, challenging. Um, obviously, a key challenge within that, obviously, to the way forward is how do we build that capacity um, within the communities um, in terms of how we deliver health and social care services um, effectively. So how do you think that we, um, we could, um, this could be done or should be done? Thanks. I, I think it's an interesting the way you put that question because I, I'm, I'm not sure that you know, the top priority in my book is to build capacity to deliver services. I think it's the top priority is to build capacity to reduce the demand for services. And I think there are a range of things that the third sector actually does in communities or, or is a vehicle for in communities such as um, um, befriending and lunch clubs and um, care and repair initiatives and the food train and, and so on. There's, there's a raft of um, third sector interventions which actually enable people to sustain themselves in communities and to be independent. Community transport is a classic example of that. Now, um, these aren't commissioned care services. These are actually voluntary organisations um, doing things with communities which enable older people to, to be independent. And I think we need much more of that just now. And it's, it's, it's actually precisely those services that are most under threat from the um, reductions in public expenditure. Um, as, as the you know, budgets tighten, what actually happens is the statutory services, the formal services, um, um, retain a, an element of priority and anything else is seen as marginal. And I think that's exactly the wrong way around. So I, I think that uh, an investment in those services that enable older people to uh, sustain their independence and good health in the community would be genuine prevention. My worry is that we all run after this word called prevention, but actually it's interpreted in much the same way as a change fund was uh, interpreted uh, to mean that um, change, uh, you know, new ways of uh, intervening in people's lives in, in providing services um, have priority rather than ways in which people can uh, make decisions for themselves. Um, I, I, I do want to open up here, I think, one area that's not, you know, I think had enough priority, which is... It seems to me we're having these conversations about the bill and about the delivery of services um, without sufficient reference to the, the other bill that's going through about self-directed support, <laughs> which actually is, is, you know, it seems to me these, these two bills are like ships that are passing in the night, actually. Um, self-directed support ought to enable people to make decisions for themselves about <coughs> the kind of support and infrastructure they need to meet their needs. Uh, and that is absolutely fundamental to the, 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 the kind of canvas of um, services going forward. 
Mr McCann, should just hold on to that thought a second. If Mr Mayor, Mr Henderson wants to answer Aileen McLeod, please do. But there was two supplementaries. Perhaps we could take Richard Lyle's supplementary just now and you could reflect on both of them. That allows to get through the questions more speedily. Uh, it's, again, basically on the, the, the point of your submissions, uh, which are in some ways quite critical. Um, uh, if I can read into a record, and I agree, uh, the sector provides 85% of the care homes in Scotland, 50% of care at home, there are more older people in care homes at night than uh, night of the week than in hospitals, and more care workers employed in private and voluntary sectors than in the public sector. I love the bit about, uh, from I think Ronald Mayer, the mundane title of the bill may also tend to obscure the factor of its impact uh, in Scotland, uh, and quite a number of critical points, you know. But again, you, you know, coming from local authority background, involved with many local organisations, many, many sectors. You know, who would you suggest if you were uh, in the partnership or, or in the, the, the organisation, who would talk for you all? Who would be at the table? And if you were included, would you really need a vote? Now, I, I think my committee members have, have uh, jumped the queue in terms <laughs> of asking questions. We've got a very patient Rhoda Grant there who, who, who was next. So, uh, Ailey McLeod had asked about building capacity in the sector, and I think Mr Lyle was asking about who would represent the, the third and independent sector, and would it, should it ever have to come to a vote? Mr Mayor, I know, did want to come in. Uh, if I can try and, uh, in some ways, answer both points. I think we have good experience to draw on from the Change Fund and Reshaping Care Partnerships. We've tested the ground on some of this. We do have representation. We have worked out how to do it. The who, I mean, there are representative bodies. Uh, I'm, I sit on the, the Glasgow Reshaping Care Partnership uh, steering group and the, the third sector is represented through the Glasgow Council of Voluntary Service, the independent sector through Scottish Care. So in a sense we've worked out the who <laughs> uh, um, and, and that's been you know, quite, quite important. So I think in a sense one of my disappointments with the bill is we don't seem to have said What's working, and some of that ground has been painfully made, uh, actually, over the last piece of time. It didn't happen automatically. Uh, there were bits where initially the involvement of the third and independent sector felt quite tokenistic, um, but has um, you know, improved <laughs> as we've demonstrated that we're bringing something to the table. In terms of capacity, I mean, again, the, we've had a dual model about how, do, how are our sectors enabled to be full partners. There has been some money channelled from government towards supporting the sectors and their engagement. And there has been some money invested by local partnerships in saying, if we want the, the third and independent sectors to be full partners, to deliver new models of care on the ground, etc., then we will have to uh, you know, put, put some resource into that. So, so I think we have some good experience uh, that we could draw on, and it, it appears to me that, we, that we're not actually doing that. Uh, so we wouldn't, you know, it's not that we have to say, well, how do you represent these sectors? How do you create joint structures? How do you develop capacity? Because we've been doing that for the last two or three years. That's the journey we've been on with, with, uh, with, with reshaping care. And, and I think we should try and, and capture some of that and, and build on it rather than start again uh, which it seems to be dangerously the, 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 the bill might push us in that direction. Andrew Henderson? I think the, uh, the bill makes reference to the, the, the third sector, the voluntary sector. It makes reference to the for-profit independent sector and the not-for-profit service providing sector. And I think that's an important distinction because I think, you know, there is no one single body that is going to represent the totality um, of the third sector views. And I think as service providers, which I obviously represent, you know, we have a view about the contribution we can make. That might be different from some of the community groups, some of the volunteering groups. But I think it's, it's, it, it shouldn't be beyond the imagination of the partnerships to actually look at how they get those voices heard and how they enable those voices to be heard. A lot of change that has happened in the past has often been miscommunicated so that the issues around 
we're closing a hospital. Well, actually, we, we only hear the headline that the hospital's closing. We don't hear the headline that actually we're going to develop better services in the community sometimes. So how is it that we're not communicating and engaging with communities? So I think, yes, there might be capacity issues, but I think there is a willingness, there is a, a creativeness, there's an inventiveness within the sector. We will find ways to participate. And it would be much better if we're invited to be there as equal partners rather than us having to sort of barge the door down. Um, so, so, you know, I think that there, there needs to be something on the face of the bill that says you have to involve the third sector. But how could be left to some local um, discretion? And I think that the, we already do have the models, as I say, within community planning third sector interfaces, that then becomes our job to make sure that we feel our views are being represented through those third sector interfaces. But I don't think there is a one size fits all that we can simply say they'll be the body. Mr Simon, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, no. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Thank you. Um, just wheeling um, the discussion back a little um, to where the plea was to be, on the go to be involved in governance and indeed commissioning. How would you then deal with that, um, given the rules and regulations about governance and financial interests involved in the public sector, very strict guidance about how people can use their influence in decision making? It seems to me that if you are contractors, you would be on the board and commissioning services that your organisation would have a financial interest in. And it seems to me that there would be a, a, a huge conflict there that would be very difficult to manage because there is no statutory control of your organisations as such. Um, so how would, how would that work? Uh, I think we'll, we'll start with Mr Henderson this time, but all three of you wish, wish to respond to that, yes? Um, well, I, I think that if we have a conflict of interest, that conflict of interest is shared by the other partners as well as they provide services. Um, statutory control... But that's their role. To, that's, uh, well, that, that is why they've been set up as yeah, public organisations yeah. to provide those services. And in terms of statutory control, then the scrutiny that we are subjected to is uh, as intense, if not more intense, than some, certainly some aspects of the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. Um, where we have to be registered providers, we have to go through all sorts of processes, um, we're inspected regularly, we are held accountable. Um, we are also in the main charities and we are held accountable through that process by Oscar as well. So we, we are very much um, subject to, to controls and limits in terms of what we can do. I think, again, that perhaps, but I think your starting point again is to is to jump to the point where we're getting into um, potential arguments about who does what and, uh, and all the rest of it. If this is about fundamentally shifting the landscape in terms of health and social care, about thinking about the, the Christie Commission principles, moving things upstream, beginning to think about prevention, then we need to be there as part of this discussion to make sure that we actually help shift the agenda. As I said earlier, we have a long history of being able to be creative and innovative, finding different ways, different solutions. And I think that having all the people there that are actually contributing to what happens in health and social care, people have to be on an equal basis. I think, you know, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll stop there actually, because I think the, the governance issues are important, but they shouldn't get in the way of us actually losing sight of what we're actually trying to achieve. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a, an important issue and we have, to, we have to answer it. I mean, Scottish Care is not a service delivery organisation. It's a not-for-profit representative body. That's what it is. Um, so in terms of being able to represent the potential contribution of the sector as a whole without, in a sense, feeling compromised uh, or a conflict of interest, I, I think we can do that, possibly more so than local authorities who may want to protect in-house services, uh, whilst uh, you know, supposedly adopting an, uh, an, an open uh, options appraisal process. So, so I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't necessarily agree that the conflict of interest applies particularly to us and not to possibly to sta the statutory partners. 
I think the important point, and it's one that I think I've made to this committee before uh, when, uh, with, in other discussion, I mean, is about the regulation and, uh, I, 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 and uh, of commissioning processes. So I think we do need clear national standards. We, there does need to be regulation of that process to, to ensure transparency. Uh, um, and uh, as I say, I mean, I think the, the involvement at a strategic level in commissioning is about what is the, the services, what's both the, 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 the volume of services we require, the range of services we require, how are we going to shape the models of care that are going to deliver what's needed in the future? And, and if we don't, if we're not there at the table, we get into some just wasted time. Um, we're in discussion with one health board and local authority area uh, at the moment over the development of intermediate care to prevent people going into hospital. And what did happen in a traditional way was the, 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 the local authority commissioning staff went into a darkened room and, and came out with a speck of what they, what they wanted, which, once it was presented to uh, providers, it became very clear was non-deliverable in the ways that were wanted. In other words, we've got to be involved at an earlier stage to shape the models of care that are actually going to deliver what's needed. So I, I don't think there's a, 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 a conflict of interest that cannot be overcome. And I think the gains of having us involved from the outset in the commissioning process far outweigh uh, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the concerns that we might be at all partisan in how we, how, how, how we went about that. Mr. Singh. Um, yes, I, I mean, it's difficult having um, read the evidence given by local government last week not to conclude that here was the promotion of self-interest um, on a grand scale. Um, so to be accused that we were somehow going to promote our own interests in um, these commissioning and um, governance arrangements, um, it, it seems to me rather rich uh, because, you know, um, for, for our sins, Ronald and I sit on the National Delivery Group for Health and Care, and we've, we've had two special meetings over the summer to consider this bill and its implications. And those um, discussions, if that's the best, that's a very polite word for them, have been absolutely dominated by the pursuit of self, of institutional interest of health and local government, um, to the point where um, the purpose of the legislation and the interests of people who might need access to services has been almost completely absent from our discussions. And one of the things that I think the third sector might bring to um, the, the top tables would be a, 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 you know, a continual focus on those needs on what the purpose of the exercise is, on what the object is, what it is that we're trying to achieve. I think that if you take a, a kind of top-down approach to public authorities delivering things either directly or indirectly to people, you get into this business where you're thinking about conflicts of interest. But I think if the bill was somehow turned on its head and you were thinking, how do we build a system of health and care um, support um, um, from the bottom up, which was based on what communities and individuals uh, need and their interests, uh, which was underpinned by um, the rights of individuals to make choices about the services that they felt were appropriate to their needs, you would come to a completely different set of conclusions where health and care institutions were the servants of those processes rather than the masters. And I think the problem here is that the bill is in a very traditional Scottish public service, top-down way, is actually paternalistic at its, at, at its heart. And it is the exact antithesis of the recipe that Campbell Christie set out in his um, report, which was about building um, services around communities and their needs. We are here building structures um, around, around institutional interests. Yes, I mean, there is nothing to stop people being, or other organisations being involved um, in community planning. My concern, none of you have answered this at all, is not only to be seen to be fair, but to be fair. How would you set up the governance structures that would mean that Joe Public wasn't sitting there thinking, we have got private contractors involved in this decision making. We've got um, third sector organisations who are going to make a profit out of this, all sitting making the decisions about how this care is delivered. And come, how do you prove to them that 
you're not doing it with the self-interest of your organisation and their interest at the heart of it. Now, people within health boards do not have a financial interest, neither does local government. They've got a de democratic interest to serve their public. They're elected on and off to do that. They're representatives of the public. How do you square that circle to be seen not only to be making that decision properly, but how can that be made transparently and governed in a way that fits up with standards in public life? Martin Sain. Well, voluntary organisations, I mean, I mean, voluntary organisations deliver and care are almost universally charitable. Um, they don't distribute profit. There's no personal gain. There's no private, um, there's no private advantage. Um, and any resources that they do generate go straight back into the cause and mission that they, they're set to represent. They are a public good. So if a charity was sitting at a top table um, articulating a view on behalf of the community it seeks to represent, um, then I'm not sure that the public would have a great deal of problem with that, actually. The public seems to support um, the idea that charities can play a bigger role in the community and have got significant confidence in them. And, of course, charities are subject to... Um, adequate, proper regulatory frameworks, thanks to the, the, the sterling work of this Parliament to pass a Scottish charity uh, legislation for the first time and to establish Oscar to make sure that charities are, are, are keeping to their bona fides. But it does seem to me that we're, we're kind of missing the point because not all charities have a service delivery interest in, um, in, in these agendas. There are charities who have a representational interest and the third sector interfaces, for example, don't deliver health and care. They deliver support to the third sector who do deliver health and care. And so it's perfectly reasonable for us, I think, um, to be represented at the top table without any conflict of interest. I think the problem is, and you see it manifest in adult care services, is that where local government thinks that the best way to get the best value out of working with the third sector, best value, interestingly, is a is a, a term they don't apply to themselves, uh, the, to get the best value out of working with the third sector is, is through competitive commissioning processes um, and, and offering contracts to the, what's large, usually the, the, the cheapest provider of services. And I think there's lots of evidence, particularly from some pretty innovative work that the health department is now doing with the third sector, um, that that doesn't get the best out of the third sector uh, because all you get is what you've written down in your contract. You don't actually get the third sector using its development expertise. You don't get volunteers engaged in the service. You don't get um, a kind of developmental approach where we might find other resources to bring to the table. You get none of that if it's on a commissioned, contracted basis. Uh, and that's, the way, that's, that's not the way forward, I think, for health and care services um, delivered by the third sector. We need to find new ways to, to, to generate proper partnership between the third sector and the state to get the best out of both worlds. Mr Mayor, how would you address the conflict that Rhoda Grant was perhaps suggesting? OK. I, I mean, a couple of things, really, to, to add. I mean, obviously, partly as has been said by others, I don't necessarily think that we are caught in that trap, but, uh, and I think we have, as I say, the evidence base from uh, Reshaping Care and the Change Fund would be that we've discharged those, that involvement in a, in a very even-handed way, in a non-partisan way, uh, uh, but, so I think there has, but that, it has to be open to scrutiny. I think there are options which simply are the, the, over certain decisions, people, you know, withdraw from those decisions. I don't, you know, people can declare interest if there is, if there, if there is any perceived uh, conflict. I think we can separate off within commissioning the strategic planning element and even the, the kind of broad options appraisal element from the procurement aspect. I wouldn't expect to be involved in any of the decisions about how services are procured that should be a transparent process, whether it's through a tendering model, whether it's through other models of, of procurement. Uh, so you, you actually separate the bit which is about the planning function and the options appraisal function uh, from the actual mechanics of, of procuring uh, services, because I think it would be inappropriate for uh, sector representatives, if you like, to be involved at, at, at that level. So, I, so again, I don't think the one cancels out, out the other. I think it's about being clear about the, the, the level of involvement, the range of decision makings that you're engaged in, uh, and that there are clear and transparent processes which mean that, in a sense, there is, there, there is no <laughs> conflict of interest when it comes to 
uh, uh, the procurement of services. However, as I said, I would equally apply that rigour to local authorities uh, and that you shouldn't be able to uh, uh, allocate contracts to in-house public bodies uh, 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 whilst insisting on tendering and retendering processes for the third and independent sectors. Uh, so if, let's have one set of rules for everybody going forward uh, and, and transparency for everyone going forward. Mr Henderson, would you like to add anything? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, that, that just to reiterate, we are a not-for-profit sector and we are charities, so there, there is no profit motive. And as Martin said, everything goes back into the work we do. It, it's interesting, within CCPS, we are about 73 organisations, all social care providers. Um, about 75% of our income comes from public bodies in terms of uh, contracts, service level agreements, grants. The other 25% is money that we generate ourselves through individ uh, from individuals, from charitable trusts, from other um, pots of money. That money is all going back into the public good as well, so we already add considerable benefit. Um, we're not in it to build empires and to um, deliver um, simply for the organisations. We are there because we believe passionately in delivering better <coughs> outcomes for people in the community. So I think and the public have, as Martin said, have the ability to um, have confidence in charities through some of the structures that are already around there. The, the bit about the, the commissioning and contracting, I would absolutely echo that. I mean, local authorities are now putting out tenders where they're capping the rate at about 14, 15 pounds, and they're saying, you will not get more than this. And we know their in-house services are at least 10 pounds an hour more than that. It is not a level playing field. There is already a lot of self-interest evident within public sector. And we do need to be able to sort of get to grips with that. Otherwise, if we simply move the structure and we have the same behaviour, we're not going to achieve the goal of this bill. Would you like to add anything? No, i not really had a, an answer to my question, but I don't think I will. So I think I'll just leave it there. OK, uh, thank you very much, Rhoda. Uh, Mark MacDonald. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Convener. I think that... While I understand entirely the, the, the need for the third sector to be um, confident that th this bill will not exclude um, some of the good work that is being done currently, I do think that um, I, I wonder, first of all, if you have a view on whether or not the issue around third sector engagement is actually something that needs to be on the face of the bill and whether there are ways through the development of guidance that could ensure that the, the role of the third sector were taken into consideration and, and that might give some comfort to, to yourselves. Mr. Sain? We seem to be um, you know, covering some of this ground. Let's, let's see if we can look at this in a slightly different way. Um, I, I, I'm a bit of a skeptic about whether this bill achieves its intended purposes or will it will achieve its intended purposes so um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that all of these discussions we're having about the role of third sector are actually best um, had solely in relation to the bill itself uh, they ought to be more in relation to how the third sector engages with public authorities more generally um, and how it engages um, um, locally but having said that and having come from the perspective that the third sector's engagement in the delivery of health and care services and in the support of communities is absolutely critical for the future because I don't think there, is a, there, there isn't a plan B that involves not using the third sector, not working with the third sector, or not building strong communities. It doesn't exist. Um, then it seems incredibly unfortunate to have a bill such as this which completely marginalises the third sector to some kind of downstream deliverer of public sector priorities. It simply doesn't work. I think a lot of the bill is totemic anyway, so let's have the totemic engagement of the third sector recognised on the, uh, the, 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 the front page of the bill um, to, to, to send a very clear message to public authorities, which we, you know, the last um, session that you, you, session of witnesses, I, I think reflected the view that, um, well, of course, we don't need the third sector at the strategic level, we just need them when it comes to delivery. Um, that sort of message is incredibly damaging um, to the interests of 
um, the people who use health and care services in the long run. Um, we actually need the, the, more of the third sector engagement at the, third se at, at the strategic level, um, and, and this bill doesn't, doesn't get there in its current form. Mr Henderson, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, well, it does feel a bit like, you know, we're, we're going over this uh, in great detail. I mean, I think it is, it, it, there's been a lot of history within the, this parliament of um, putting principles um, right up front on bills. And I guess within this particular piece of legislation, a lot of this is now the principles and the, the aims are in the policy memorandum. We would like to see a bit more of that on the face of the bill. And I think in particular, the, the inclusion on the, the um, equal status of the third sector should be part of that. So it's a, it's a principled argument to some extent, rather than simply a case of, because I, I think Martin's right, that there maybe are some areas of, of, of tokenism within that. But I think it's an important token that actually we are an accepted and credible part of what happens in public service world in Scotland. Mr Mayor, I'm assuming you're going to agree with that? I'm, no, I'm going to disagree wildly. <laughs> um, the, I, 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 I listened to the Cabinet Secretary last week um, emphasising again that the change was uh, towards integration was not about structures, it was about culture, it was about vision. And in one sense, I agree with that, but the structures we develop have to reflect the culture and vision that we, we want to have. And if that is about partnership, then the structures have to embody that, uh, 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 that, 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 that partnership. So I think we don't need to go into huge detail about the involvement of the third independent sector on the face of the bill, but the requirement that they should be uh, 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 fully included should be there. So, so I, I, think it, I think the detail can be in guidance. Uh, I think it is for local partners to work out some of the mechanics that we've discussed this morning uh, uh, and come up with the working answers. Uh, if we haven't managed to provide them now, hopefully, actually, we can find them at, a, 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 at local level as we try and move things forward. So, so I think it's, it's simply the absence of reference to us. It's not that we're needing a whole lot of, of, of comfort built into the face of the bill, but I think we do, we do, the, the, some acknowledgement that we exist would be marginally helpful. Okay. Um, I think this comes back to the, the, the difficulty that exists is that it is easy to define a local authority and who is accountable within a local authority. It is easy to define a health board and who is accountable within a health board. The difficulty that exists for many is how do you firstly define who is accountable with or, or who is responsible within the third sector, given that it can range from national organisations who are um, you know, it, it, it very prominent to local organisations who are often much less prominent. Um, and how do you ensure that whoever, rather than having, you know, a hundred different voices at the table, how can you ensure that you have one voice at the table which will adequately represent that range of interests? Mr. Same, yes. Uh, uh, you know, in a sense, we've covered this because on reshaping, uh, reshaping care for older people, that it was it was agreed at a national level, that the third sector interfaces would take on the responsibility of enabling the third sector to be <laughs> represented, full stop. And those third sector interfaces have a responsibility written into their funding agreement with the Scottish Government to engage with all parts of the third sector and to enable the, the third sector to represent itself to public authorities. You will not get a corporate view because we do not have a single view about these matters. You will get lots of different views. And that, actually, that diversity is a critical strength of the third sector. So you need to have an enabling mechanism, which is the interfaces. There is no other. Uh, it's their core business. They have to reconcile the needs of small local and community organisations with the needs of big national care providers and housing associations and a whole lot of other um, um, interests that the third sector has, including um, those organisations which we don't seem to be spending enough time on, which are about giving voice. 
to particular needs and interests in communities. Um, for carer groups, for example, are represented and have a role um, to play in all of this, surely. Um, people with disabilities, where, where is their voice going to be heard in, amidst all these um, structures and infrastructures? So the third sector interface is the starting point for that consideration. Um, they do receive modest central funding to enable them to be independent from um, local government and the health service uh, and other public authorities. They are already playing this role in community planning in every part of the country. Um, there is no reason why they can't, with a modest investment, um, um, play this, um, this, this role, as they have done over the Change Fund for Older People, play this role uh, in, in, in these arrangements going forward. And you know, my preference would be that that is um, recognised on the face of the bill. Mr. Mayor, I wasn't sure if you went in, but because of time constraints... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm happy to advance. leave it. I think the focus okay. should be on, on what has worked within the, the, the change fund arrangements, because we're already doing this, okay. uh, and, uh, and, and we, so we don't need to reinvent it. Okay, so I've got three colleagues okay. still wishing I, I, to ask well, questions, Mark. I did have one further question, convener, so if you, uh, will, if you uh, will allow me. Of course, yes, um, briefly, hopefully. Yeah, and, and it was just in relation to what Mr. Mayor's point in response to, to Rhoda Grant, and the first thing I would say is I wouldn't want the, the panel to think that I'm in any way trying to downplay the importance of, of third sector partners, but at the same time, we do have to look very carefully at how the, how the interaction would exist within the bill. And Mr. Mayor appeared to suggest that what could happen was that there would be an, a third sector involvement in areas like, for example, strategic planning, um, but that that involvement could then be removed at the point of commissioning and procurement. And my question would be whether you could disaggregate to that level, given that strategic planning will, by definition, inform the commissioning and procurement approach that is taken. I think I, yeah. I was seeing it all as part of strategic joint commissioning and the principles of which are, are being shaped. Um, but one could separate off within a com a, an overarching commissioning approach the strategic planning and options appraisal aspect from the procurement aspect. So I, I, I'm saying sector representatives would not need and arguably should not be involved at the procurement end. I would not want to be involved in, in evaluating tender bids or something that came in from different provider organisations. I would think that would be wholly inappropriate. I do think as a sector representative, I should be involved in the design stage, the strategic planning stage, the weighing up of how are we best going to secure this provision going forward. I think in all of those areas, we can add value to those discussions and indeed make the procurement exercise more productive when it happens, uh, I, 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 in ensuring that it, 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 it achieves what its, its purpose. So I, I, I would... I would think if we use the principles of strategic joint commissioning and allow uh, third and independent sector representatives to be involved at that level, uh, but leave the procurement to the statutory agencies, then I think there is a separation and an avoidance of conflict. Mr Henderson? Well, I mean, I think, again, this goes back to the diversity of the sector. And, you know, I, I would hope that people who use services, people who care for people who use services, are heavily involved in the decisions about what services are procured. Um, and, and they have their own structures, they have representative groups, they have bodies. So, in a sense, are we talking about third sector representatives or are we talking about third sector advocates? Because I think that might be the, the clearer role, that people are actually given some voice from a local level to contribute, not just at the big picture, but also at the very local picture. So, it will be different horses for different courses within a very diverse sector. Is there, before Mr. Syme comes in, is, is is this something that could perhaps be dealt with through, um, for example, a requirement to have uh, meaningful consultation with the third sector rather than the third sector being involved and, and, and the possibility of the, of the lines of accountability, the, the, the conflicts of interest, would therefore be perhaps removed I, that, that are being yeah. raised? I, I mean, personally, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that way forward. It, it, it does seem to me that we're talking about um, a, a kind of paradigm where the public sector does things like procurement to us. 
And I think that already is beyond the kind of policy intentions of the legislation, which is to um, create partnerships to enable us all to play to our strengths. And it, 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 it seems to me that, you know, if, if, if the bill as it's, as it's currently set out and, and the intentions as you've described them and um, the discussion about conflicts of interest being solely something that applies to the third sector rather than something that applies equally across the public sector, we're already in, in a kind of hier hierarchical um, relationship which sees the th third sector as the deliverer of public sector priorities. And that is really not the best way to get the best out of us, and it's certainly not the best way to create a partnership. Um, and it certainly wouldn't go down well um, amongst um, um, organisations working at the front line in terms of um, public authorities telling us what to do. Um, why is it that procurement is a, a process that's only applied externally and not something that's applied to public authority delivery of services too. Um, you know, we're, we're, we need to move on from this. Mr. Mayor, um, yes, but what, I, I one need to say very this, quick but, but point. briefly so I can get two, 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 two further questions before okay. we close. Just, just to say, I mean, that the model that we're sort of advocating here is the one that Audit Scotland advocated last year in its report on public sector, the social care commissioning which was actually saying you need to involve providers at a much earlier stage in the process, not just at the procurement end of it, that you get poorer results. This is, this is not an argument about, as I say, some sort of empire building on our part. This is actually how do we get better outcomes for people. Um, also, at the end of the day, the, the drive and self-directed support will also mean that increasingly it's the empowerment of individuals to make choices about, about the services they get. So I think we are going to have to change this emphasis on the, the kind of local authorities as controlling the, the commissioning process. Thank you, Mark. We're going to have to move on oh, no. from there. Annette Millen, you've been very patient. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased that Mr. Syme mentioned the SDS bill, which, of course, is now actually an act of Parliament, because um, I've long felt, and I think I'm on record as saying that it wouldn't work properly until we did achieve the cultural shift that integration of adult health and social care um, should, should bring to us. So I wonder if the, the, the panel could say, do they believe that this bill will facilitate the, the implementation of SDS? Uh, I, in, in the sort of integrated arrangements, and how do you think it could best do that? Uh, see, Mr. Sign first to catch my eye there. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to say yes, um, but unfortunately, my view is um, I, I don't think the, 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 there's, there's, there's strong enough evidence here um, that the bill will um, lead to the kind of changes we need to make um, self-directed support the, the norm. Um, I think we need a bit of history. We need to look back over the last um, 10 years to successive failures to um, drive integration, to join up services, to join up budgets, to join up processes, um, and ask ourselves whether this piece of legislation is going to somehow overcome all those difficulties. I, 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 I don't understand the evidence. I, I haven't seen the evidence. I'm, I'm, I'm really not um, convinced. Perhaps um, the... The example I could, I could best give about, about the potential um, for self-directed support and um, the work of the third sector to change the lives of people for the better is um, around Alzheimer's. And I think the, the, the government's made a, a very welcome commitment um, that individuals uh, who are diagnosed as um, with, diagnosed with Alzheimer's have a right, and I use the words, I think very important, they have a right to a year of post-diagnostic support. And I think that's a, that's a huge advance, and I know that that's you know, been looked at um, around Europe, actually, about whether that's, you know, how, how, how that could be implemented elsewhere. So it's a really, you know, it's a, it's a, it reflects great credit on the parliament and government that, 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 that that's been instituted. And I understand that there are voluntary organizations who feel that at the end of that year, they're able to come, come in and work with the families and with people themselves to deliver a package of care that's based on what they want using a right to self-directed support. And I think you could see that overnight, you know, over the next few years, we're going to see a huge change to the quality of services and to the relevance of those services to, the in to individuals, um, which actually all the evidence suggests is going to 
reduced demand on formal public services in, 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 the, in the long term is going to be cost effective and it's going to deliver for families. Now, that, those changes are possible because of the self-directed support legislation, but they're also um, got nothing to do with this particular bill. This bill is absolutely irrelevant to those changes. So we are ab able to, to change things on the ground in a way because of self-directed support and because of the work of the third sector, um, which is, would have been unimaginable in the past. And I actually think we need to you know, pause and reflect on that, ex that experience and to think how we can get more um, uh, of the benefits of self-directed support legislation and the uh, engagement of the third sector and, uh, with, with um, individuals, carers and their families um, to drive new models of care. Because I think that's the way forward rather than all this commissioning stuff. Mr. Mayor, do you see a link to self-directed support and Mr. Henderson after? Yes. Uh, I mean, certainly, I don't think the bill ties up. I, I think there's a lack of connectedness between the different policy agendas. So we have got the, the national dementia strategy. We have got self-directed support. I, it seems to me that, that the bill doesn't do quite enough to actually show the connectedness, evidence the connectedness of the different strands. I don't think the bill in itself says enough about choice, empowerment, uh, control being with service users. Um, I don't think it even does enough to emphasise that the, the, the quality of care outcomes is, is what should drive commissioning, for instance. This is not how do we get services at the lowest possible cost. This is actually about how do we deliver improved outcomes. So I think some of there is a tension between uh, the, 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 what's in the bill itself and, and what we're trying to achieve with self-directed support. Hopefully there's a point at which the two have to come together on the ground, if not in, if, if not in terms of legislation. Uh, 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 but, but I don't think the bill does enough to capture that, the connectedness uh, between the different strands. Well, I think there are a, a number of issues. I mean, it, it really doesn't capture so the self-direct support stuff at all in this bill. I think we also have the situation where the self-direct support act, sorry, it was, um, it, it's largely about local authority spend and not health spend. And in the new integrated budget, our concern would be how are we going to, if money has to lose its identity, there's no longer a health pound or a social care pound, there is just a pound for health and social care, what are the implications in terms of charging? What are the implications in terms of eligibility? How does the health authority view the money being used for social care purposes? I think there's lots of things that need to be um, bottomed out there. However, at the core of this, the culture that we want is actually reflected in the Self-Direct Support Act, one where people are where citizens are empowered, where they have choice and control, where they're no longer simply passive recipients, but they're active participants in their care pathway or in their care journey. Um, and so it would be really interesting to see much more about how SDS can help shape the future of health and social care integration, rather than it simply being seen as a subset of what already exists. I find that very interesting because I, I was, was concerned during evidence taking for the, the self-directed support bill um, that there, there seemed to be this sort of almost disconnect between the statutory bodies and, and I think to get the culture change to, to really properly bring, bring them together, uh, you know, with, with, with hearts as well as minds um, did, did actually concern me and that's why I thought it, the bill, the act, wouldn't really work properly unless what we're discussing now was effective in you bring it, bringing that, uh, that cultural change about. So I was interested to hear what you well, said. One, I mean, absolutely, I want answers to this question. Of course we do. We've got one further question, and time is almost upon us, so brevity would be good. I know it is an important question, well, Mr Henderson. Word, and part of that, trust. We, we've talked a lot about whether the third sector can be trusted as partners. I guess that's been a, a major theme of the discussion this morning. Do we actually trust citizens to make the right choices and decisions for themselves? And it seems to me that the, the secret of the Self-Direct Support Act will be whether we actually trust people and empower people to make choices and take control. And at the moment, I have to say, there's a bit of foot dragging on some of that. Um, and, you know, it becomes the law next April. I, I think it's going to take a few years to bed in, but trust is at the heart of a lot of what we're talking about here.
Anything to add, Mr Mayor? There's, there's a parallel bit, though, within the bill, which I think is relevant, and that is that there is some emphasis on locality and locality planning, and there is a kind of similar bit about what will we be prepared to devolve to localities? Will we give them control of budgets? Will we <laughs> allow empower localities in the same way as we're talking about in relation to self-directed support? Will we actually trust a, a, a trust individuals? Will we trust local communities? So I think that that for me would be the strongest potential connection if we get the locality planning aspect of things right within this bill. Mr. Syme, do you want to add anything? Um, well, simply that this, this is a debate about institutions, and I'm, I'm not convinced that rearranging the institutional furniture is actually going to get us to the point that, that we need to. We should be having this debate about how to face the demographics. And if we don't um, have that debate, and if this is, that's postponed because we're all busy shuffling the deck chairs, then um, the ship will sink. Okay. I think I'm going to move to our last question in a second. I think if I didn't make a brief comment in relation to self-directed support, um, uh, carers and adults with learning disabilities in Glasgow would, would think I wasn't adequately representing them. Um, I think there's a feeling that self-directed support in Glasgow has been used, and this may link into other decisions to mask budget decisions by a local authority rather than the spirit of the self-directed support bill and actually a local authority agenda other than actually asking individuals what they really want. And I'll leave that sitting there. It's just that my own constituents would have been writing to me and saying, why didn't you mention that when self-directed support was, was mentioned? So I felt I had an obligation to, to do that. Just very quickly respond, because I think we've, we're, okay, having, yes. <laughs> we're having this debate in, um, in, in the third sector about our attitude to self-directed support being influenced by its inappropriate application as a means of rationing. Um, by local government, mm. but I think for me it asks a much, a much. I mean, I, I, mean, I think we need we stand by the principle of self-directed support and its empowerment and user choice um, um, that it that it offers, but I think it asks a much more fundamental question of us as all: is why is the application or delivery of self-directed support um, a, a subject of variable um, responsibility of local government? Why why can't this parliament just say, well, everybody's got a right to this, and establish? Um, what that right into, you know, in, in, involves in terms of resources. Um, you know, it's only, we're only talking about a population of 5 million people, after all. Um, you, you could cut the resources a different way, it seems to me, and to have 32 separate discussions about what um, self-directed support means for people with Alzheimer's, I think, doesn't actually do justice to the, to the interests of those, those people. I think we wouldn't have to leave both my comment and your comment, Mr. Syme, sitting there on, on, the, on the public record. Um, Final question from Malcolm Chisholm. I'm going to try, try and move on to one final new area, but I must say I've, I've enjoyed the discussion and I think that we could say a lot more about connecting the bill with other areas of policy. And I also agree with what you've been saying about the gap in several ways between the policy memorandum and the bill. And I would agree with the third sector as one of those issues that quality is another which some of you have made in your submissions, which we haven't got time to talk about, but clearly that's something that's very important as well. But the, the area that I did want to talk about was budgets, which is not actually unrelated to what Martin Syme said about demography, but I, I did, it did strike me that Nigel Henderson's or his paper's comment about budgets was, was extremely interesting because uh, I haven't read all the submissions, but I, th I think it was quite an unusual comment because I suppose the general, a lot of the direction is towards let's have more local flexibility. But as, as I understand it, what Nigel Henderson's group are saying is, look, you're going to have so much trouble working out, particularly around the acute budgets, how much money is going to come in and how much is going to come from health and how much in general and how much has come from local authorities. So in a sense, we have this view from, 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 from that organisation organization that budgets should be centrally set. Now, this, this, but given that budgets are such a key issue of all this, I did think it important to ask him in particular what his thinking behind that was, but obviously it would be interesting to, um, to hear from the other two about that as well. And since I'm only asking one question, my final comment would be, although I'm quite attracted to that idea, I suppose it probably does mean that you have a greater degree of prescription around the services which are attached to that budget. Mr Henderson, yes. Absolutely. I mean, I think Martin's described this as a, you know, a very sort of institution-focused discussion. I think one of our concerns um, post the bill being launched was that uh, we already sense that local authorities and health boards are looking to minimise what they might have to put into the integrated pot. And, and we worry that we could be creating this whole new infrastructure 
and actually they have very little control over very little money. Um, we think there needs to be more prescription about what money should be allocated to the, the Joint Health and Social Care Partnership Fund. Um, we somewhat tongue-in-cheek put forward this notion that surely the government should actually practice what it preaches. At the moment, it's got an NHS budget and it's got a local government budget. Should it not actually start out with an integrated budget? And therefore, you, you do an element of, of top slicing and say, this is the budget for health and social care partnerships. This is the budget for the health service. This is the budget for local authorities. So that you actually have a new budget line in the Scottish Parliament budget. I understand that could be very controversial. That would be seen as taking away local control, local accountability. It would be seen to be perhaps going back to the days of ring fencing. There are dangers because we know if money is ring fenced, that's as much as will be spent, um, not any more. But in order to maybe start this process off in the way that it needs to continue, it could be maybe for a period of time that that would be a possibility to actually start with an integrated budget right at the centre. Mr. Mayor? I agree with Nigel. It's, it's interesting. In the last months, I think there's been a retreat from the enthusiasm of pool budgets with both local authorities and health boards looking to uh, hold on to <laughs> uh, more resource within each of their uh, separate areas as opposed to the money going into the, to, to the shared pot. So I think there are some issues about what is put into the budget and then what what decisions are made about it. I think there are two other difficulties to touch on. Um, the, the, the shift in, although we talk a lot about the shift in the balance of care, we've actually to date through the, the, the three years of the, the change fund seen very limited shift in the balance of resource. So keeping Mrs. Smith out of hospital saves money on paper, but there's no shift of corresponding shift of resource. The money doesn't follow Mrs. Smith. Uh, um, and that creates that creates a difficulty because actually there's an increased spending requirement to maintain Mrs. Smith in the community, whilst you're also uh, uh, maintaining the spend within the hospital sector. So we haven't actually seen this big shift that we that we, that, that was seen as one of the things that would create sustainability going forward. I think the, and I think we've yet to come up with a workable model on that. The, the final bit, perhaps, around budgets is simply that I think we've continued to see the overall requirement for a realistic budget for older people's care to be, in, in, some of the, in the delivery group, the elephant in the room. That is, there is going to be a shortfall between now and, and 2020. We're going, we're going to run into difficulties. We are, as a, as a society, going to actually have to find ways of spending more money. Spend it better, spend the existing pot more effectively. Yes, seek to control a, a demand and reduce demand, but actually I think even if we do all that and become more efficient, there is still going to be a shortfall. Mr. Sain? Um, welfare changes, demography, and public expenditure cuts are all heading us down um, a, a really difficult route here. And there was this expectation that we needed to get all of our ducks in our row, and part of that involves integrating health and care, because that's surely going to help us get all our ducks in a row and create efficiencies. And it's a huge disappointment for those of us who've been engaged in this process for many years. Um, to discover that right at the last minute there is no prospect of significant agreement between health and local government about how much money goes into this pot. And if there isn't that agreement, then the purpose of this legislation simply um, defeats me. Um, so um, we are at a critical point. Uh, it could be that a whole lot of backstairs arms, arm twisting will get some level of agreement, although the latest I understand is that um, the standoff position for health that's acceptable is that it should be just a matter of local agreement at how much health money goes into the budget. Well, uh, that could mean a lot, it could mean a little, it could mean local variation wins out, so COSLA will be happy, um, but it won't drive any of the changes that um, are necessary in order for us to meet these, um, these challenges. Um, I think we need to ask ourselves some pretty uncomfortable questions about you know, is the, is the current standard of anonymous 15-minute care visits in a hurry 
really the kind of future that we want for our care services. Is having a voluntary sector workforce on minimum hours, zero hours contracts, uh, minimum wage, zero hours contracts, and without pensions, the kind of um, future you want for your care workers? Um, it, you know, what, what is the case against national rates for, for care uh, or national rates for self directed support? Um, if any of those things were done, if the centre said this is how much money is going to our future health, it would take a lot of the heat out of the institutional um, battleground that's going on just now about power and responsibility. And it is an institutional um, battle uh, for which the third sector has absolutely no, um, no interest in taking sides. Um, it's a very unedifying sight. Uh, and I don't think it's really getting us to the point that we need to, we need to get to um, where we're all perfectly aligned to use the limited resources we've got to meet what are really quite substantial and growing demands in our community. Any of that? No, thank you, Malcolm. Um, well, only because of time constraints, I'll, I'll not ask if there's any additional comments you wish to make just now as I did with the first panel, but I am sure you, you're, you're vocal enough that you will write to us and follow this very closely as you have been already. So uh, please do that. It does help us form an opinion as we continue to scrutinise this bill. Uh, so can I thank our three witnesses? Uh, and, and the second evidence session, of course, once again to the witnesses in our first evidence session as we continue to scrutinise this bill. Thank you very much. And as previously agreed, we now move into private session.